meeting to order the April 16th, 2020 uh, select board meeting being held virtually over Zoom. I'll ask the town administrator, David Williams, to read the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, uh, we'll have the consent agenda with a payroll warrant and meeting calendar and set the next meeting dates. And then the first item is request for pedestrian cross light from Steve Solomon Program Church and Coolidge Crossing, Meadowbrook Commons, Roy McDowell, presentation of Commons project drawings. Then consideration of Chapter 90 road projects, John Colleen, DPW director. And then number five, consideration of items in response to COVID-19 local emergency, various due date extensions and related relief measures for property tax, interest and penalty waivers, abatements, excise tax, and other. Um, bifurcated annual town meeting split between June 16th, 20 and the fall and consideration of town election date and then tax revenue anticipation note with Heidi Doyle town treasurer. And then lastly, the routine items are consideration of administration items, uh, finance director, FY21 budget development update, town administrator, draft response to Verizon regarding cable contract negotiating and select board members report. Then adjourn to executive session to possibly return to open session. There are four items. Number one is MGL chapter 30A section 21A subsection three, discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town and the chair so declares. Police officers union may return to open session Item two, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection two, conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Police officers union may return to open session. Item three, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, town administrator, may return to open session. Item four, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to threatened potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town and the chairs and declares library. Thank you, David. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So move. Second. All right, all those in favor? George? Mr. Johnson? Yes, Paul. George, uh, before we do the vote, is this meeting being recorded? Yes. 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 Did say that. Okay, just to let everybody know this meeting is being recorded. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, so yes. Well, there wasn't notice when people signed on that it's being recorded. But right. Right. Funders. All right. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Dorensis? Yes. Mr. Jan? Yes. Mr. Waldron? Yes. Okay. Now, um, I did have one request for public comment by Jeff Waldron. Uh, so if you want to go ahead with that, Jeff. Go yeah, ahead. Thanks, George. This is one I've done before from the Board of Health. The Board of Health has actively been seeking volunteers for what's called the Medical Reserve Corps. We have an existing reserve corps, and it serves a lot of functions in a normal year in town, including the flu clinics and other things like that. But obviously now the need is more urgent. So what they want to say is they're looking for both medical and public health professionals as well as other community members without healthcare backgrounds. And they engage the uh, members in a variety of functions in town and to improve emergency response and, and build our community resiliency. So the, the, there's a detailed process for how you um, uh, can be accepted in the MRC and you um, can contact the Board of Health uh, from their website and they'll have the information there and you actually get licensed by the state. Um, to be part of the MRC. So you'll have a, uh, a badge that um, designate, so designates you. So anyone that's interested, at least call the Board of Health and you can discuss with uh, Ellen Harknett, the uh, administrator, the um, requirements and what types of assignments there are. But they're very active. They've been helping out already. 
and we need more. Thanks, also, George. I'll Thanks. add, this is Daryl Beardsley, Thanks, Darryl. chair of the Sherborne Board of Health. Yes. And uh, another thing that we're anticipating is that we'll have need as we move ahead. We have flu clinics in the fall and some, and that will probably be more complicated this year because of COVID-19. And then hopefully when a vaccine is available for this coronavirus, we'll certainly need help with that. And if you are on the MRC, you and your family get priority for getting vaccines along with uh, other medical personnel because you are potentially dealing with the public. And then the last thing I'll mention is that if you join the MRC, it does not mean that you have to do whatever comes along. You are asked, can you help out with activity X and you can accept or decline. So. Thank you, Daryl. Um, Chuck, go ahead. Um, just for a matter of corporate governance, um, the boards that I sit on for uh, companies when we're doing either uh, telephone calls or Zoom meetings, I think it's important for the minutes to reflect that the members could all hear and understand each other. And we've already seen a demonstration of that in the uh, approval of the um, agenda. But uh, Diane, just it, it's important to note that the, the voting members were able to hear and um, understand each other. Thanks, Chuck. The other thing I just want to point out, if every, anybody who's not speaking, the board members should stay unmuted and David Williams should stay unmuted, but anybody else should stay muted until I call on you. And if you do have a question or comment, please use the chat window and I can recognize you there. I have it open on my computer so I can see who wants to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, that's the best way to get my attention is through the chat window rather than waving in your screen because some people are on a second screen and I don't necessarily see them. So, um, so yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. Next. Can I ask yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, where is where is Paul? Paul's on here. I see him. He's on Paul's iPhone. Is his uh, in his library? Yes, I'm right here. <laughs> okay. All right. You got you got him. No, oh, but that's okay. Oh, <laughs> yep, got him. Is it on the right page now? All right. Thanks. Yep. And one other thing you could do, David, other than you can force everyone else to be muted other than the members, if, if that makes things easier. I think as you're the administrator of the meeting, correct, David? Yes. Okay, so you can mute everybody else if that makes things easier. But right now I have, I'm not getting a lot of interference. Sometimes you do. Um, okay. Next on our agenda is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion from one of the board members to approve the, well, I think we want to actually discuss the meeting calendar because there's a question mark on there as to when we want to have our next meeting. So why don't we, before we move to approve it, let's talk about that. In two weeks, we could have a meeting on April 30th or we could push it a week to May 7th. I think it probably makes sense to do meetings every two weeks at this point. So I would think April 30th would probably be the best date for us. I would concur with that, George, because also I believe aren't the advisory targeting uh, May 16th as a potential Zoom um, uh, advisory public hearing. Correct. So, so if we do April se uh, or May 7th, it might not be enough time in advance of that meeting if we had anything we needed right. to discuss. So does that work for the other board members, Eric, Paul? Yeah, both dates work for me. Okay, so let's plan on April 30th. Paul, does that work for you? Yes. Chuck? Okay, I think you said yes, you're muted, but. <laughs> Yes. Okay, great. So <laughs> do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda using the next meeting date as April 30th? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. A second by Eric Johnson. Okay, for a vote, Mr. Johnson. Voting yes. on the... Um, Can somebody party. turn off their microphone? I don't know who's talking right now. Uh, okay, Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Mr. Drensis. Aye. Mr. Yan. Aye. And I vote aye. So great. Thank you. The next item on the so David, if you could unmute him, um, that would be great. Hi, Steve, go ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for me, including uh, for including me in your agenda today. And uh, I assume that you've all uh, received a copy of the memorandum that I sent uh, with my uh, proposal on behalf of Pilgrim Church and the citizens of the town to install a flashing yellow pedestrian light at the crosswalk in front of Pilgrim Church. Uh, I can briefly summarize uh, what the proposal says, which uh, basically outlines the fact that um, between 10 and 12 o'clock noon on Sundays, between 125 and 175 adults, seniors and children cross here for Sunday church services from our parking lot across the street from the church. In addition, between 25 and 50 senior citizens cross on Thursdays for noon, clearly this was written before the current crisis, <laughs> uh, um, between 25 and 50 senior citizens cross on Thursdays uh, for noontime lunch and 150 Alcoholics Anonymous participants cross Wednesday evenings and so forth. Other groups include the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, various volunteers, and other individuals who attend meetings at the church and park in our lot across the street. With the speed of traffic passing by, this has long been identified as a, a dangerous crossing. An estimate, uh, the cost provided by Sean Colleen for purchase and installation is $5,800. The good news is that no town funds are required. Funding will be provided by a grant of $1,000 from the Sherburn Business Association with the remainder of funding coming from the Pilgrim Church Memorial and Endowment Fund. The project has been unanimously approved by the church as well as the town planning board and the traffic safety committee. No date has been established yet for its installation pending final approval by the select board. The individual at Pilgrim Church who will oversee the project is Fritz Reiner, chair of the church property trustees committee. Uh, the installation will be on town property as part of the re-landscaping of the church property in front of the building. This has long been identified as a dangerous crossing because of the speed of traffic going by. Um, and this really will benefit the community as a whole. Uh, in particular, I just wanna thank um, for the consideration of helping me with this project uh, in addition to the church are Marian Neutra, Susie Tyler, and Sean Colleen. I'm happy to answer any questions. So this sounds like uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you've got a grant from the Business Association. I think these are the kind of projects that their brew fest that they do every year, year really help. Um, and that the church is, you're not asking for any town funds, but I think that's a great, uh, great idea to get this done for safety reasons. Anybody else on the board? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I'm just curious, is it, do you know what type of um, beacon is it? Is it an RRFB or what type of light it is? Uh, Sean, if you're there, maybe you could answer that because I certainly can't. <laughs> Sean, are you on here? Let's find him. He's here, I know he's here. I see his name on the second page. There you go, Sean. You had me, you had me muted. Can you Sean, hear me? <laughs> yeah, now we can hear you. We like you that way. Uh, <laughs> I know. I'm kidding. Oftentimes, I'm kidding. people wish they had that mute button. <laughs> the um, I, that's the only thing I don't have in front of me is the quote. I think Steve might have the quote in front of him. It's it's basically the same unit. I had him quote almost the same exact unit that's that's in front of the um, fire station and the apothecary. Okay. Um, with the exception of the posts, they're making they've lightened everything up quite a bit because of the LEDs. And the solar panels are a little bit smaller, so it doesn't it doesn't require the same four inch round posts and bases that we had on the other one. Um, we may choose to do that. We're going to do the installation because currently it just requires two two inch square posts. Um, yeah, they don't have to be wired together. Sure. No, they're no, they're not wired together. There's no okay. wiring. My only my only recommendation if it's not, is to at least look at the price of an RRFB, that's Rectangular Rapid Flashing Beacon, because they have shown to be much more effective than any other style crosswalks, to the point of 90% effective in studies. And I don't know how much it is. If it's the same type that's in front of the fire station, it's not gonna be the same. But I was encouraged to at least look at those because they're just much more effective. And this is a mid-block crosswalk, which is just gonna be, I think is, 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 is dangerous overall. I mean, we have too many mid-block crosswalks in town in general. And I, like I said, I would encourage you to look at an RRFB style. So George? Yes, go ahead, Paul. I'd like to make a motion to approve the installation of 
this uh, crosswalk uh, uh, flashing sign as proposed. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I'll take a vote. Unless we have any other discussion. Under discussion, I want to note that the plan oh, board- I got, an, I got an answer for Eric's question. Go ahead, uh, just a second, Sean. Paul, go ahead. That the planning board's endorsed this, the traffic safety committee has endorsed it. The church itself has endorsed it. So it's official request from the church. And as someone who goes by that location frequently, I see the need for it and agree that it would be a, a big safety improvement. Sean, do you have something to add? Yeah, it's listed as a double-sided RFB. Well, it is an RFB. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I'll second the, the motion. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So do I, if I have no other discussion, then I'll take a vote. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. Mr. Dorenthus? Aye. Mr. Jan? Uh, aye. Could you have Libby give me some of that coffee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll vote aye as well. Uh, thank you. That's a vote of five zero. Thank you, Steve, for coming to our meeting tonight. Thank you and, for having me. And I'm glad this worked out for you guys. Great. Thanks very much. All right. So next on our agenda is, hold on, let me scroll up. Um, consideration, uh, no, Coolidge Crossing, Meadowbrook Commons. Roy McDowell presentation of Commons Projects drawing. Um, I know we've seen these ahead of time. I think David, you're gonna share Todd McDowell's screen so he can show the proposal that they have for Coolidge, for Meadowbrook Commons in, on Coolidge Street. And then if you could unmute, I think it's Roy. I think there's Roy and Todd and Roy the third. And Jen, I think Roy is listed under Jenny McDowell on here. So just make sure he's unmuted as well. Uh, trying. I got Todd and Roy are unmuted, but I'm not able there's, to there's get There's one listed as, Jeff, there's one listed as Jenny McDowell. That's, I see, that's, but the unmute button's not working. I don't oh, know if he has. Okay. Jenny Roy, McDowell is Roy, Roy Senior. Roy, if you can hear me, if you could unmute yourself, I think you've got yourself muted. Not, yeah, whoever, the, who, yeah, there you go. Nope, backwards. There you go. <laughs> okay, so if you guys want to go ahead um, <laughs> and make your presentation, that would be great. All right, uh, my name is Roy McDowell, and I want to thank all of you for uh, having us present this evening. I'd like to introduce my team. Uh, three of the team members we have this evening with us are my sons, Roy, my other son, Todd, and Eric Swenson. Uh, based on development is our core company. We are real estate developers. We've done recent projects, I think two or three of them in Framingham. We've done projects in Hopkinton, one called Legacy Farms. It's a 730 acre development of which 500 acres we put into conservation, uh, working very closely with the community. We actually went to town meeting originally because it was such a massive project and we got an 87% approval rating at town meeting for the project. So it's been a very cooperative relationship with the community of Hopkinton in our project. We've also worked very closely on our project as the master developer working with Pulte Homes. And as you know, Pulte put this property under agreement on Coolidge Street very recently, of which portion of it for the 55 and older they want to develop. And they brought us in for us to look at the multifamily rental product because that's pretty much the majority of what we do. And so we put the property under agreement with Pulte in the interim, we put the adjacent parcel with Aaron Paddock next door under agreement as well. Uh, our original plan that we did preliminarily just using the Pulte site was 120 units, two buildings of 60 units each. Um, once we uh, put under agreement the Paddock parcel, we felt we could come up with a much better plan, which we've given you uh, for this evening which instead of being two 60 unit buildings is now three 40 unit buildings and allowing us not only to break down the mass, but to move one of the buildings much further back on the site to the point where it's probably 600 feet back from the road. Um, Todd, did you put this up or did David? 
Uh, I'm trying to. Is it is it showing my screen? I, yes, it's I share think, screen. If not, I think it's your screen that's showing. So go ahead. Todd, would you, Todd, would you mind going to the first one that shows the grades and all? That's the second one. Yes. The second one. Okay, I don't have it in front of me. It's it's up. Is it not showing it? No. No. It'll take a little bit. I said share screen. So that's all right. Oh, we can we'll, 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 share. Let's just yeah. talk. Let's Todd, talk. Let's Let's Todd, can I try uh, if I do this? No, it's on, it's on your screen. If you move that arrow on the upper, there you go. Is it not showing? That's how we can stay with this one. It's not. It's not David, well, this is David Williams' screen that's showing. So okay, there, we, go. Part, there we, we go. We just we just had it. Go to the second page, David. There you go. Thank you. So if you look at with us um, through the between the second and third building, you see a little, it looks like a stone wall. There's a stone wall there. That's actually the property line between the two parcels, which I don't know who's got the mouse, but if you can move it over in, in that area there. So by, by realigning the lot lines and creating a larger parcel, taking the, piecing of the, the piece of the rear of the paddock property, it allows us to break the property down to three buildings, uh, staying out of the 50 foot buffer, which I had a conversation with the chair of the uh, CONCOM today, and creating a small sort of residential house scale clubhouse in the very entrance of the property. So what that allows us to do is leave a landscape buffer along the street to put in some significant sized coniferous trees. So in fact, when you're driving by, you're not feeling the scale and the sense of the project. And as you drive in, first thing you'll see is a clubhouse in a pool area. You drive a little further with parking areas, you have the first building with 40 units. And then as you drive in further, an additional building of 40 units. And again, even deeper into the site, backing up to the Pulte side of the site, there'd be another 40 unit building. And the idea of this is to break down the buildings. Each would have an elevator in the building to uh, make it for, we, our intention, even though it's a 40B project and 25% of it's affordable, it's going to be first class construction, the kind of quality and detailing that we do on other projects that aren't affordable, something that I think Sherman would be very proud of and happy to have. Now, what you'll see, there's a wetlands area on the upper side of the first building. There's a wetlands. You can see we're surrounded by wetland zones on the left and on the right. So we spend a lot of time looking at grades, drainage, uh, locations of buildings, making sure we stay out of the 50-foot buffer. And you see a, a connector road that loops around. It says 10% grade on it. That may or may not be necessary, depending on whether the fire department is going to require it or not, because that could be an emergency access if it's required necessary for the Pulte project up above. Roy, Todd, Eric, is anything any of you want to add to this one? I just mentioned building three, the one for this in the back. I don't think you'll even see that from the street at all. Uh, and building one will be uh, hidden a little bit by the landscape buffer between the clubhouse and the area in front of the clubhouse. The other thing I want to mention is I, I'm sure you're all aware, Pulte and I think Mark Mastriani may be on this call and he could answer questions relative to the permitting. But Pulte has been working very closely with Framingham and Natick framing him with water and Natick with sewer to bring it to this site and their site. So we're not no longer dealing with the issues of putting in wells so people are concerned about ground contamination or putting in a sewer treatment plant, which might have the same issues. So I think it'd be a much more efficient and a safer project to have public utilities coming to the site. One thing I'd mention is, I said there's a question, th these would be a 120 rental apartments uh, with a 25% being affordable, all 120 would count towards the uh, affordable housing inventory of Sherburn. And I think the good thing going from the 88 that was originally proposed to the 120, number one, we now have more land so we can actually break the mass down on this more than we would have even on the, on the 88. I believe this would not only cover you for your 210 census, I think it would cover you also for your uh, one, uh, two, uh, 2020 census as well. I think that, on that, Roy, just to interrupt, yeah. uh, John Higley can jump in here too, but I think his calculations, this might actually take us through our 2030 census. Even better. So. Can I ask a question, George? 
Sure. Go on. Are you okay with questions now, Roy, or do you? Oh, yeah, sure. We can, you know, whatever you want to do. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Just, I didn't understand one thing you said. You, you said you're working with Natick and Framingham for water and for sewer. Is that nailed down or is that in process? In other words, do you have it or is it? Well, I should, and Mark, Mark, are you on the phone? I am on the phone. Am I, am I muted? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Mark. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good question, Paul. Um, this is Mark Mastriani. I'm with Pulte Homes. We're the developer of Meadowbrook Commons, the other development here that was a, the senior housing development that was approved by town meeting. Um, we, we went before your board probably six to nine months ago and got direction from both the planning board and the selectmen that would be preferred to, as Roy mentioned, to bring public utilities in both water and sewer um, for, for the water and for the on-site water and on-site sewer challenges that were discussed. And since those meetings, we have been uh, working very closely with Natick to bring um, Natick sewer to both of these developments. Um, it is not nailed down. Um, but we have made significant progress. Um, the town of Natick and Jeremy Marset and his team uh, hired Haley and Ward to, um, to, to run their model of their sewer system adjacent to Sherwood. And, um, and we've completed the modeling and we have a framework uh, agreement in place that is currently being reviewed by uh, town Council and uh, town man the town manager of Natick and Jeremy Marset and his team. So there's a framework in place um, and what we're, what we're asking for and what we really need um, before we come back to your board is what we've asked for is a will serve letter. So not the official IMA because that takes time and there's a lot of details that goes into that. But what we've asked Natick for is, you know, these are the items that are important to you. These are the, the items that are important to us. Here's the framework of our agreement. And if we, if we c commit to these items and we complete all of these items, um, then you, you agree that you will service our developments with sewer. And we're, we're very close to getting that will serve letter from Natick for sewer. So um, that's sewer. And then, um, water will come from the city of Framingham. And we're taking a very, very similar approach with Framingham. And, um, and again, uh, Framingham and Jim Barsante and his team hired Beta as their review engineer to, um, to, run the, the, to update the models and run all the modelings and the hydraulics of Framingham's water system. And that modeling has recently just been completed. And we are now working on the framework of the agreement of what it will take for Framingham, the city of Framingham, to agree to provide water to these developments. So um, we've made a lot of progress, but it is not nailed down. So uh, we hope to continue to make progress here in the short term. And, um, and once we get those two will serve letters, so the the will serve letter from Natick for sewer and the will serve letter for water from Framingham, I think then we would come back to Sherborne uh, and, and work with Sean, um, I know who's on the call, and work with the fire chief and work with your board and the planning board um, and work with Gino and really move, move both of these projects, move our project forward. Um, but um, so that's our plan, and, and we're hope we're making a lot of progress, and we hope to complete those will serve letters, you know, very shortly. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have a question from the chat from Sanford Lane. Uh, David, if you could recognize him, unmute him so he can ask a question. Sanford, are you there? Yes. He's unmuted. Okay, Sanford, go ahead. Yes, uh, <clears throat> can you show um, either on this map or a different map where exactly uh, it is on Coolidge and its relationship to Meadowbrook Road? I I'll know. say the, the, the power lines uh, are on this kind of far 
uh, right side of the, of this lot of the, of the where the black line is. Uh, Meadowbrook would be to the north, which is to the left side of this. Unfortunately, we didn't have a graphic that goes that far out. Um, but Meadowbrook is uh, a little bit uh, of a distance to the left of what you're seeing here. Yeah, Sanford, if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see the numbers of the houses on Coolidge. Um, I know that this, there's one right next to the driveway is 84 Coolidge, okay. and then there's other houses. So it's far to the left of this, as this map shows. Wow. Yeah, there's 86 is right 86, there, 84 right. is where the clubhouse is. Yep, and if you go further to the left, if, David, if you scroll, nope, the other way, scroll the other way. There's, oh, keep going, keep going, sorry. You went the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. <laughs> The other left. Go the other way. 94. 94, I see. Yep, so you keep going up and I, I know um, there's one further, two. Further, further down from that. I'm guessing, Todd, would you guess it's about 1,500 feet? Uh, I would have measured it, but sure. And, and the 10% uh, grade line that you have, uh, road that you come have going out the back? Yes. That what connects with Meadowbrook? Oh no, that that connects into the Pulte development itself. I see. It's, it's really, a, it's, really a, it's, it's, it's really an emergency access driveway. It would have gates on either end of it, so the public could not use it. We didn't show those on this plan, but they're showed kind of the gates on the rendering. Okay. Um, Does that answer your question, Sanford? Because I know Chuck Yan had a couple of questions as well. Yes, please. The road. Go, ahead. Go ahead, Chuck. No, he said it's not going he said to be. Okay. A couple of comments and then also a couple of questions. And we, uh, the comments are, um, <clears throat> well, I think you probably already are aware of this, but the town meeting that um, Sherburn had considering this project uh, didn't quite achieve 87%. It was 86.7%. And at the time, both Gino and John Higley both were identifying, and a number of uh, town boards identified the importance of the sewer and water connection and the flexibility it gave to move the one building in particular, the very large building, back off the road. So this plan accomplishes that uh, significantly by moving it, uh, moving it back. So uh, the, the, the planning board and Gino and John and uh, Addie May were all very uh, uh, correct in uh, identifying the flexibility that those hookups, the water and sewer hookups could give us. So kudos on the design. I had uh, several questions. Why don't I give them to you uh, together so you can answer them uh, uh, in whatever order you want. Um, how many units, apartment units per building will there be? How many bedrooms per unit, the square footage, and um, the just the, uh, the approximate timeline that you're talking about at this point. I know it's still- oh, if, we, if, we, if we get it fully approved tonight, we'll start next week. <laughs> uh, the timeline the timeline is really going to depend frankly on as you know 40 B's aren't that quick so we have to go to the state we have to go through uh, your various boards including your ZBA I'm sure we've got to go through the CONCOM is it a year is it a year and a quarter a year and a half I'm not exactly sure it's it's probably somewhere in those realms as far as the breakdown there are three buildings that each have 40 units of them, three stories with an elevator. We have a combination of one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. I believe we have 10% three bedrooms per uh, zoning requirements for 40 Bs. And the rest will be a mixture of twos and threes, probably slightly, I don't have the exact numbers, days. slightly more twos and ones. Do you have them, Todd? I, I believe it was 10% uh, threes yep. around 55% twos and 35% ones off the top of my head. Those numbers might slightly be off, but they're, it's in that ballpark. Now, a lot of times on projects will have a certain amount of studios. We're not doing that here because we don't believe this is a studio market. I think, you know, we're gonna, I, we, we see a lot of empty nesters living here. Uh, people probably first stage before they buy a home. People who frankly want to live in the community of Sherman living here. So I think the, the, the ranges of square footage could be anywhere from a, a one bedroom in the 750 to 850 range, two bedrooms anywhere from 11 to 
as much as 1300 square feet potentially. So we're gonna have a range. The three bedrooms could be 12 to 1400 square feet, sort of in those ranges. Great. Perfect, thank you. And I should also mention, which I'm sure you're all aware, because it's a rental project, not only are the 25% affordable, but all 120 units count towards your numbers. Right, we're very aware of that. That's, that's for sure. I know talking with the housing development plan that that's, that's been, I think, the desire to, to look at this project and, and the real importance of the rental part portion of this. I would just to follow up on what Roy said, I, I would mention that because our targeted demographic is more of an empty nester demographic, uh, the units will be a little bit larger because uh, that age group or target group typically likes a larger unit with larger furniture. And that's why oh, we're putting an elevator in each building as well. And I know one thing that was asked before, we've talked about this before, was the request for a potential bus stop that would take people to the to the train station? Yeah, we, we've just done one in a project. We uh, finished building now in Framingham where we actually recontoured the sidewalk and did a bus stop where the bus actually pulls off the street. We put a little shelter in. I think something like that could easily be accommodated here. Great. Um, Daryl Beardsley, Darryl Beardsley had a question that says, can the roofs be designed and or oriented so as to accommodate solar panels in keeping with the town sustainability initiatives? Uh, that might be difficult because one thing we're trying to avoid is having all the H H uh, HVAC units and air conditioning units on the ground, which is a visual blight. So what we're ideally doing here, we've done other projects, you'll have the, uh, the concept of a mansard roof. It looks like a typical shingle roof. But in the middle of that, we have a, uh, a pit, which is a fairly large, which hides all the mechanicals. So aesthetically for people driving by or living here, you don't see all those mechanicals. We can look into that, but it may be more difficult. I, it's something I've been looking to try to incorporate in projects. This site is a little more difficult because you have some tall trees around it as, and it was, the wetlands kind of dictate which way the buildings are pointing at this point. So it gets a little bit tougher because mm -hmm. the uh, south would be to the right, which makes it a little more difficult. We, we, we can do a little more study on it, but we don't have an answer tonight. Do you know, um, Eric, go ahead. Do you want to ask the question? Um, I think you're unmuted. Yeah, I was wondering, um, I, I'm very interested in the bus option. Can you get a commitment from the MWRTA to actually provide that bus service? Yeah, Eric, I was going to jump in. I, uh, when Ben Stevens pr pr presented this project, I have a fairly firm recollection that he had spoken to the uh, Metro West Regional Transit Authority and um, they, no formal commitment, but they had verbally agreed with the idea of extending the Speen Street bus stop <clears throat> down to the edge of the property, which actually makes sense. I mean, this, you've got the density to, uh, to do it. I don't think it was in the form of a formal commitment, but I, I do distinctly recall Ben Stevens saying that he'd have that discussion with the, uh, uh, What's the acronym? MWRA, isn't it? MWRTA. And RTA, be, yeah. to be honest, uh, John Higley, I think, is on this call, and I think John is actually on the board of, or, or somehow affiliated with the MWRTA. John, do you have a comment? If you're unmuted. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Sherman's representative to the uh, MWRTA board, and we'll be bringing it up at a future meeting. Kind of wanted to get this far, but. Um, They've already had interest. So, back when this was first being discussed, it was it was aware they were aware of it. So now that we have uh, a design to look at and things like that, I'll bring it up at the at the uh, at a future meeting. Right. If, if you ever want us to meet with them, we're happy to do so because we've done that in the past. That that would be great, and, it, and it's this is very consistent with the MWRTA <clears throat> goals, and Sherburn is a is a, a member of that of that region so uh that uh roy that would be a, that's a nice offer and I'll, I'll look to take you up on it thank you do i have any other if you have questions please just um shoot me a message in chat if not roy and todd if you wanted to talk more about any of the i know you have sure. some slides here so go ahead i think we go to the rendered plan todd the first page yes yeah, yeah go, to, go to the first page david there you go so what you'll see here is 
the as Todd mentioned, there's a hundred foot electrical easement on the far right side of the site. That's why that's pretty much staying open. Some of the parking in the very front will be under that, which we have the right to do. Uh, you'll notice there's a lighter green section behind buildings one and two. That is the wetlands area. Now, I say it's wetlands. It's not standing water. It has wetlands vegetation, but it is grass. Uh, maybe in very heavy storms it gets wet, but pretty much it's, it'll be a nice view of a field, if you will, from these buildings. It seems the current owner mows it a couple times a year. Something that if we'd like to talk to Concom about continuing doing uh, going forward. You'll also notice in the very front entrance, you'll see some lettered colored trees where that clubhouse and pool are. Our intention is to do something very attractive to make a very appealing entrance, probably with a stone wall, an old New England farm stone wall, and put in some large evergreen trees, whether dug fir, spruce, whatever the hemlocks, whatever the case may be, something of scale and character. So when you're looking at the project, you can almost drive by it and almost miss it. And the idea is to just have it blend in. Todd, do you want to go to some uh, representative samples of uh, buildings? Yeah, I think David yeah. has control on the screen, right? Yeah, David has control. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, this is a building we, we looked at with the architect we're using. And don't take this as exactly what we're doing. This is sort of give you a sense of scale of a three-story building. Now this building as well, you see it's got a shingle roof, but behind that, there's that large pit where all the mechanicals are up on the roof, so you don't see them on the ground. And you'll see that every, every unit has a deck outside. This particular building has some stone uh, siding, siding on it. And it's got, uh, this particular one has a board and batten. Whether we do that or we do clapboards, we can discuss that with your various committees at the appropriate time. We definitely want to do warmer, softer tone colors. We're not going to be doing any outrageous colors on the buildings. You know, I think things that fit in the New England landscape would be our intention. Can we go to the next one, please, David? Again, you'll see shingle roofs. This particular one has a clubhouse in the front. And you'll see again, three stories, shingle roof, um, combination. I would mention our clubhouse that we're proposing would be one story, but it would have, we'd, we'd want to have some volume in it. Uh, like the gym, we'd want higher ceilings. So it'd be more like a one and a half story looking building. So could I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Paul Dorrance is here. I'm really troubled by the three story massive scale of these buildings. They're really not consistent with anything else we have in town. Is it possible to do two stories and spread this out a little more? Unfortunately, we don't have the land to do that. I think if we, if we take the, if you go back to the first the picture prior to this example, I think it's more egregious looking with those light colors. But I also think landscaping can make a tremendous difference. You know, if we put in some fairly large deciduous and coniferous trees in various locations to bring down the mass and the scale. And I also think what we're going to be doing very shortly is we're going to go out and uh, put stakes in the ground where all four built, excuse me, all three buildings are going. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how far they are back from the street. And the fact that I think the visual impact from the road is going to be fairly minimal. And I think, I think that's going to be important. There's no way really I'll also say from a construction point of view, to build 120 units in multifamily is, is difficult from a management point of view because it's not a large enough number of units. Typically, we build 180 to 300 in that range. That way there you can have full-time management, which we plan on having here, full-time maintenance. So the economies of scale are very important. Having anything under three stories, even if you had enough land, from a construction cost point of view, it would be very hard to get to work because now you're doing many more foundations, many more roofs, much more perimeter of that type of thing. So it would be very difficult to get this job project to work economically with only two stories. But I think there are plenty of ways visually we can mitigate that. And I think once we stake out all three buildings, I'd encourage us maybe to have a, a field visit when the time is appropriate to walk it so you can get a visual sense of what the visual impact is from the road. I, I think we have a slide showing just something to that effect too. Yeah, just one second. I have a question from Jean 
who asked, will there be blasting on either site that could disrupt bedrock general chemical plume issue? Uh, we hope not, but I, I can't definitively say that yet. I'll t I, I will say this, if you look at the current grades on the site, we're proposing raising the grades anywhere from one foot to three and a half feet in various locations. And one of the biggest reasons is we're gonna need storm water retention on the site. So we're gonna need to put in some extensive cultex in the site under the parking areas. Also, the more, the more we raise it, the less likely we have to have to deal with ledge because we'll have our utilities deep enough in the revised grades that we can actually run our water lines and our sewer lines and not be worried about that much blasting. Yeah. I have another question. Our goal, our goal is to minimize any blasting. Great. Roy, Mr. I have another question from Daryl Beardsley uh, that says, how about either of less blocky structure or less re re repetitious, sorry, design? Less repetitive. I'm going to show the next slide as well because I think that one is a little bit different too, the, the fifth page. There you go. I don't know. Oh, ahead. You'd right. have to zoom out on this one though a little bit. Yeah, this, this, this. a little bit, David. Okay, so this give you a sense. So keep I mean, going. If, yeah, I think you can go out even further if you can. Oh, there you go. There we go. So the idea is, you'll notice this trees in the foreground, there's trees in the background. I think in a project like this, especially in a, a community like Sherburn, where there's a lot of trees and a lot of sense of scale, I think having some significant trees to break up the visual aspects of these buildings we're very sensitive to. I mean, for 50 years, we've been in the landscape architectural design build business as well. So we understand that. And I also think the colors that are chosen, a lot of times in architecture, when you have a building of multiple stories, architects will tell you, you wanna break the building down to base, middle and top and not have a, this homogeneous look in buildings. This, this is actually a good example of what not to do because you see all the, same color goes top to bottom. And I think if we break down the scale of the buildings with not only different materials, base, middle, and top, but different colors and different tones, I think that'll go a long way to achieving that desired effect. And again, as we, as we move along in architecture, we can show you that. Yeah. Who is George, somebody trying to ask a question? George, um, it would be helpful um, if we identified, I don't know who, who, who Gene is, I have, oh. Sorry, I don't know either. It just said Gene asked a question. So if somebody could un unmute Gene, they can identify themselves. That would be good. Hi, uh, Gene Wedemeyer. Oh, thank you. Uh, where, what's your address in town? Uh, 25 Meadowbrook. Okay, thank you. Chuck, go ahead. Did you have another question, Chuck? No, that's all. Just go ahead, Roy and Todd, if you want to continue. Sure. So the reason why we put this image in here is less to do about the building than more to do about open space and landscape. As I had mentioned, the wetlands area that is behind the buildings very much would look like what this field is here and that it's a, it's a green open space. So I think the idea is to not only do heavy landscaping to make the buildings fit in like they've been there, but also have sufficient open space so you don't feel like you're just totally crowded in. That makes sense. And again, we're, these, all these ideas are evolving and we don't normally submit at this early stage, but I thought it was important to get this going and get a sense of you from the boards as to what we're doing and uh, progress from there. Right, and let me ask you, I know you mentioned earlier that you spoke to the chair of the Conservation Commission earlier today. How did that go? Um, again, I don't, I, I don't think Neil, Neil, you're not on the call, are you? Uh, I, I didn't I've, his name, so. Yeah, I've never spoken to Neil before, and I thought it was really important to speak to him prior to this evening's call. Uh, being the chair of the Conservation Commission, I, I felt it was important that he hear from me what we're thinking and what we're doing prior to going public with it. And I think he appreciated that. Uh, I think he also liked the idea of 120 units, probably getting the town well beyond the 2020 census and not have to deal with two or three other projects in town. I think that rang a bell. I did bring up the fact that these buildings are uh, just outside the 50 foot buffer. And, you know, he said that's a totally in the purview, which I understand. Uh, he, I also mentioned to him that we probably have to do some um, grading temporarily within the 50 
while we build the buildings, but then fully restore it, fully reseed it, and put it back to its previous condition, which he said that, you know, we obviously have to come forth with plans to show them exactly what we're thinking about. But uh, all in all, I thought the call went very well. Good, good. Um, Sanford Lane, I know you have another question. Uh, David, could you unmute him, please? Yeah, I just wanted, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to know how many cars there are spaces for and how that impacts uh, egress uh, for Coolidge. When you say egress, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, so, so I, I'll, I'll jump in. This. We're planning, the site plan currently shows about 1.8 spots per unit. So we're typically finding there are a lot less cars than that in these type of products. It's closer to 1.35, 1.4. Um, and one of the other things regarding uh, enter and exit and traffic is typically well, uh, the people that live here aren't your typical nine to five and you don't have all the cars going out at nine o'clock and coming home at five, but people tend to be a lot more work from home people as well as people who kind of leave and come throughout the day versus all at one time. Yeah, we were, we were pleasantly surprised when we laid it out that we have as much parking as we do. We are considering given who we think the audience is here of, uh, in further back locations, taking some of these parking spaces and actually putting in some small garages. Because I think a lot of what we think might be our empty, empty nester audience may not want to leave their car outside in the snow, but might like the idea of having a garage space. Okay, thank we, you. We will be doing a traffic study as well. We just haven't gotten that far yet. Stanford, do you have another question? Well, no, the, the, the issue was that there's a curve there and I'm wondering how the visual is going to be so that oncoming cars don't, you know, there's not a conflict there. Yeah, we're, we're having our engineers look at that. Initially, they think we're fine, but we'll get you more definitive uh, information on that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sanford. Uh, do I have other, any other questions? I haven't seen anybody else pop up on chat. Um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Roy and Todd, do you have anything more you would like to share with us? Well, we just, I guess, let you know that we're working very diligently. Uh, I spoke to Aaron Paddock today, who's the, the party that we're buying the adjacent parcel to, and let him, I showed him our original plan of 120 units that had all, the, it was two buildings all in our parcel. And once we made the agreement with him, uh, I told him we redesigned it to make it, we think, a, a much less impactful uh, design. And I, he understood that. And I just wanted to be clear with him what we're doing as well. Uh, we want to thank you for the time this evening and the input we're getting. I think it's all very important that we all work in unison uh, with all sure. of the boards in town. I don't mean to you, Roy. John Higley I would like to ask or uh, make a point, I believe. Sure. Um, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Roy. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. I, I just, in the course of this conversation, or I think the perspective uh, uh, is back when this uh, project was first being discussed, there was a proposal for an 88 unit uh, 40B apartment building, uh, one building four stories and very close to the road um, with on-site utilities pulling water from groundwater and, and recharging in the area, a, a potential impact, impact on the butters. I just want to say that this is a tremendous improvement. I'm very anxious to, for the town to make progress on our um, make more progress on our on our affordable housing goals. Um, but I, I just the time that's passed, uh, the, these issues having the buildings much further away from the road and all, all the things that have been mentioned is tremendous improvement. Well, thank you. And I also want to mention that you know we're not a merchant builder that's going to come in put this thing together and just sell it. Uh, our current game plan has been for the last few years, everything we build, we keep. For instance, we just recently built 234 units on the ocean and Revere Beach. We fully leased those, we're keeping them. We're building 210 units right now in Framingham, it's called The Buckley. You can look at the website, thebuckley.com when you get a chance. And uh, we're fully leasing those just starting now and we plan on keeping that. And when and if we build this, it's our intention to add this to our portfolio and be a good uh, good citizen of Framingham on this project. I have another Excuse question. Excuse me, I'm Sherbin. Yeah, I have another question from Sanford Lane. Go ahead, Sanford. Uh, yeah, you just mentioned the water from Framingham. It um, Look, Framingham's not that far away, but it's not that close. So I'm wondering if you're coming 
down Coolidge with that water or it's coming some other direction? I can answer that if, uh, if you'd like. Uh, the water will be coming down Kendall Street and then turning onto Coolidge and, and, uh, and then entering our development from Coolidge. So that's a, it's a, in other words, that's a street construction where you'll be trenching out the entire street from Framingham all the way to the development itself. Well, you're not trenching the entire street, you're trenching a small trench to get the water line. Uh, okay, but obviously that impacts. Well, it's, uh, how long does that something like that take? that, that uh, Coolidge will be bottled up? Because the track, well, okay, not right now, but the traffic going down Coolidge on the, on the uh, right side towards Shervin in the late afternoon gets pretty heavy. Um, and so I'm wondering what, which side of the street and how that will impact it. You know, honestly, those are details that, you know, I would just be guessing if I, if I share them tonight, I'm not trying to avoid your question but certainly a, a traffic uh, management plan would have to be developed and we have to work with both towns of Framingham and, and Sherborn to determine the best time, you know, to do that type of construction and how best to manage the traffic. Um, it would probably be a couple week project. And, um, but you know, those are, those inconveniences would, would be try to be minimized working with the towns and, and working with the you know, with details. I have a comment, just a second. I have a comment from Addie May Weiss from the planning board. If Addie can unmute, she can go ahead and add. I uh, yes, just, um, I just wanted to pipe in just since I kind of about 40 B's and the work that we did is on the housing production plan that if anyone has been following the 40 B process, they will remember that this is a long process and this is the previous apartment option that was at Coolidge that application never um, was finalized. So this is this requires a new application. So this is we're at we're back at the start of the process. So there will be lots of time for this to go before the state, before the and the zoning board of appeals hearings for there to be concom review, engineering review, uh, peer review. It's a it, this is you know all of the questions don't need to be answered tonight. This is just the first step. Right. And one thing I do want to mention on that front too, I know what one discussion that we've had is as rather than doing this as a traditional 40B, if the select board, you know, eventually, you know, gets to the point down the road that that we're ready to move, that we're in support of this, we could do this as a potential LIP program, which could shorten the time frame where you know the town signs off on it rather than going through the the traditional 40B program. Right. Even if, I mean, it shortened it in a sense that it signals to the state that this is something that the town is interested right. in working with. It doesn't, um, it certainly doesn't, doesn't shorten any review as far as it doesn't take away any options for a thorough review. Exactly. The like CONCOM will still have to get their approvals. The Zoning Board of Appeal will still have to, that's, that's where the ultimate approvals will come from. They'll have all their hearings. It, it's got to go through the full process anyway. Right. Chuck, go ahead. Um, question for Mark. Uh, I know that there's Framingham water to the apartment building in Sherburn next to Sunshine Dairy. I can never remember the name of it. Is the plan, maybe just too early in the process, but is the plan to extend that line to this site? Extend that line to this site. Um, the, uh, the line that feeds that apartment building in Sherburn next to Sunshine mm -hmm. Perry, um, <clears throat> which I think is on Kendall Street. So that is would that tie into the new 12 inch line that we are installed. Okay. Yeah. That ends, yeah. Right, and I think that apartment building, Kendall Crossing, I think it's called, uh, hat is partially on Framingham land, which is why that they have Framingham waters and we never had to have a IMA or an municipal agreement between us and Framingham for that property from what I understand. Mm -hmm. that, right. Guys, can I jump in on that? Yeah, go ahead, Sean. That's actually um, a very old, old water main that um, the, the Sunshine Dairy and the family has had for 
uh, at least half a century, maybe more, that feeds that. So I think when the engineers laid it out, that the entire line will get replaced all the way into Framingham. It's actually on private property. The line now is on private property, then it crosses the road to get to that building. Um, but I think the entire line gets replaced back into Framingham, retaps to the building and retaps to the Sunshine Dairy. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. I, I mean, you have the best institutional knowledge of those things, so it's good, <laughs> good to know that. Um, do we have any other questions for Roy or Todd or Mark? Well, just a question. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Uh, for the per what is the purpose of this uh, presentation in terms of what uh, what what are they looking for in terms of a vote? Oh, we're not looking for a vote. This was really informational. We wanted to give you a sense of where we headed. We wanted. To more importantly, we wanted to show you the, the site layout plan we have in mind. Uh, I also, we got that to the CONCOM today. We want them to see it. And we just wanted to, putting aside the architecture, because that's something still in motion, we wanted to just sort of maybe just get a, a general overall sense from the board. You know, do you like the way we're going? I know there'll be a million things to discuss later, but I think the critical thing is the location of the three buildings and the clubhouse and working with all the various boards on, you know, drainage, wetlands, concom, planning and architecture. But the real base thing to get this thing moving is just to get a sort of a verbal sense, if we could, how you feel about the layout of what we're doing. All right. Well, I think my personal opinion, Roy, I, I, I like the idea that you guys have been very mindful of the wetlands. Um, I like the idea of getting 120 units, quite honestly, on a project like this, um, where that would get us through the 2030 census over our 10%. And it gives us more leverage when it comes to, you know, we just went through a process with a 40B that we vehemently opposed in the middle of town that was a four story building. So something like this, I think is something personally I would support because I mean, after we see the details, but uh, because I think it's more in tune with what the town needs and it's closer to the services that you'd need in Natick. It's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, great points about this that, that personally I'd be in support of. Chuck, do you have any comments for them? No, I, uh, uh, the ability to get uh, water and sewer hook up and the flexibility of moving from <coughs> what I thought was a pretty massive building right on the uh, street. This, I, I like this layout a lot better. I didn't realize that conceivably this would get us to 2030 on the SHI, the subsidized housing inventory for 40B purposes. So that's huge. I think that was a big part of why so many folks in town supported the prior proposals, which were earlier and more conceptual. So no, I would echo what you, what you, what you said. I think this is, and I appreciate, uh, Roy, you and your team coming forward and presenting this earlier on. It's much easier to, to see a mock-up recognizing that there's lots of work to be done. So I, I think this is very helpful. And I think I've said before that um, providing SHI protection should be one of the top priorities in the town. I mean, the project on North Main Street that generated quite rightly a, a lot of opposition. Um, you know, it's the town's at risk for projects like that because we're not at the 10% SHI. So I, I don't have anything to add to what you said, George. I'm sorry, I took a lot of words to say I agree with you. <laughs> Jeff, how about you? No, I appreciate your coming to make the presentation to us and uh, at least it also just gives us a chance to mull it over a little bit too. So, so it's a way to sort of plant some seeds and then we can uh, have feedback and discussions as we go along. So I, I think it was very worthwhile and I appreciate your time. Thank Eric, you. Eric Johnson. Nope, it, uh, it looks good. I can, can't say much about the utilities. <laughs> Understood. Paul, do you have any comments for them before we move on to the next agenda item? I, I concur with the notion that uh, I appreciate them coming in with this early. 
I also very much want to achieve the 10% requirement for our 40B. I also like the idea that the big building has been moved back but I am concerned about the massing of these buildings. And so I asked that question early and I got a response back that there are ways that could, could uh, mitigate that. And, I, and so I want to see that, that mitigation and see what uh, can be done to make these buildings more, more in character with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Todd. Uh, thanks, Thank Mark. You all. And uh, we appreciate you coming in. We're going to move on to our next agenda item now. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We'll be in touch. Okay, thanks. Bye. Uh, Great. Thank you. So, Thank you. So David, do you want to go back? There you go. Thank you. Um, you read my mind. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consideration of Chapter 90 road projects. Sean? Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. So last time we spoke, we, um, you guys voted to um, basically use last year's chapter 90 money. We're actively doing that. We're, uh, we'll be paving Pleasant Street tomorrow uh, and chip sealing it later in the year once it cures. What we, just, what we also discussed was um, FY21 chapter 90 allotment and um, I, I'm hoping you guys all got my kind of last minute um, document I sent in but I, I'll just capture what's there that the allotment from from the state's 252,539 um, which of course is expected it's already committed but it's expected to be part of a transportation bond bill that'll be signed by the governor after uh, once the fiscal year starts not sure when that's going to happen. It normally would be July 1st. Um, so what we'd like to do is commit to at least some or a project. Um, it, it's typical to, to use that money in anticipation so you can, you can be working in the construction season that you're in, not the next one. Um, and I'll remind everyone that although we didn't quite finish the process that, you know, headed into town meeting, I originally had a, an ask for 450,000 that got reduced to 350,000 at an advisory meeting. Um, and then we never really got to the point where we did the full presentation of what I was going to try and do um, this construction season and into next season and obviously into the next fiscal year. But um, so a, a couple things factored into what we're doing, of course, right now, the timing of everything, there's a really, really, really low tra traffic volume um, for now and the foreseeable future. So that factors into what we're, what we're thinking about. Um, and I think everybody's had a little bit of trouble getting everyone out. Um, paving projects are starting, but it's been, you know, there was a couple week void where no sales guys were going out. People weren't going out and pricing jobs. They weren't measuring anything because everyone was locked at home. Um, so we're a little bit late to the game. I think everybody is with getting numbers together, but what we were able to get together was this year and into next year's um, at least highest priorities on the, on the chip ceiling um, road work. And as we as we discussed, and of course in this forum, I'm not going to go through the five-year plan. But um, Eric had brought up last year, one of the big things we try to do is catch a road before it falls off the cliff, um, because shimming and chip sealing, as we've seen over the past couple of years, is much quicker, much easier, and 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 far less costly than. Um, something like what we're doing on Pleasant Street where you reclaim the road and start over. So after what we what we determined was Lake Street, um, we could do the entire length of Lake Street, shim it, and chip seal the entire thing um, for $211,701. Um, Lake Street's broken into three sections, of course, the highest traffic, Volume is the is the the low section between 16 and 27, and then the middle set the middle stretch, 
Um, those two are both in pretty bad disrepair. One bad winter could knock them both off the cliff and we'd be rebuilding them. Um, the contractor is fairly certain they can shim it and, and get it back to a good base to hold a chip seal. Uh, so that's my suggestion. And then what I did is I summarized a few of the other things uh, that we want to do once we get our feet back on the ground and know what we're going to do with town meeting. Uh, Everett Street is is in danger, in danger of losing that. Prospect Street's still in good enough shape um, to chip seal. I, I'm not going forward with these yet, but I'm just giving you a clue where we might be headed. Uh, asphalt rubber chip seal is, is what we did on Elliott Street last year. We want to try and do some of that on on Western Ave before we start losing Western Ave, which we're in bad danger of. And that's a very long and wide road. So we want to try and save that. So you can, you can see those numbers. Um, I guess I should probably say them for everyone that doesn't see it. Everett street will cost 65,800 estimated prospect would be 111,637. Uh, Western Ave from route 16 to Whitney street. Uh, would be 115,000. We didn't do the section from um, Route 16 to Hollis because of some major drainage problems there, and uh, it's probably going to need to be rebuilt. But the high traffic area coming off Route 16, we're about to lose, so we, we think we can save it. Um, yep, the other number you didn't, just so people know, the number for Lake Street was 211,701. If you, they, I just, we just have that in front of us. I'm sorry if I skipped that. No problem. Uh, and then the numbers I don't have, but but just so you're aware, we're planning um, a few years after you pave a new road, we, they typically start to crack, um, and you, you got to catch them while they're still good, and you can you can do minimal cracking, and it holds it together rather than letting the water go in and, and destroy them. So Coolidge, Kendall, Speen are all cracking. They're all ready for chip, for crack sealing. North Main Street needs it again before we do any extensive work on it. We can, we can probably hold it back. And Washington Street needs it. Maple Street may as well. Um, those numbers, we don't, I don't have those yet. Obviously it's not, it's, it's not nearly as expensive as paving. Uh, so, you know, at a later date, I'll have a plan together for what we're going to hit with those once I can get the guys out. That's not as much of a crunch um, as as getting the crews in to do the shimming. So what I'm what I'm going to ask for is uh, approval to, to use fiscal 21 funds, fiscal 21 chapter 90 funds um, to shim and then to, and then double chip seal. Lake Street. The shimming would get done in May. It looks like they're going to start the crew up May 11th, so we might be the first one on it. It's a couple of days, and then the chip sealing would be later in the summer, and you know, which puts it actually into the other fiscal year. Um, okay. And we're again, still, that's that's. We yeah. approved. We approved at our last meeting, um, Pro, uh, Pleasant Street. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So are you looking for approvals tonight for us on anything or is this kind of just showing us your plan? Where are you, where are you at? Well, if you'd be inclined, I I'd like approval to use the, the fiscal 21 money for, for Lake street. Um, everything else would be on hold because everything else would either be fiscal 21, uh, budget funds or fiscal 20 or annual town meeting funds or, um, the rest of chapter 90. Okay. We, we used all the fiscal 20 chapter 90 money essentially on Pleasant once it once it's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that that's what I'd be asking okay. for at this point. It allows us to jump in one more project in the spring. Um, okay. And then um, the future Garrett, money would be full. Garrett, Jeff, Paul, Chuck, questions? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree. Um, Lake Street is fall is 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 at that critical point. It should be done this year. Um, only small concern is I think the chip seal. I'd like to see it done as soon as possible, lar largely honestly because of the triathlon. 
there's another bikes and we skidding out there and that's something that's you know pretty pretty important to the community right around the middle of uh, september but uh other than that yeah i support this okay. now and let me ask you a question are, are the chapter 21 i mean are the fiscal year 21 chapter 90 monies already approved or is there a risk of losing those with everything that's going on paul do you have an answer for that or no the, the those funds are pretty solid we're okay. trying we can get them increased but there'd be more than just the right now million okay i think i'm having a little bit of an audio issue with you paul we're, we're not i think you're you're caught up you're frozen so Sorry, we missed part of your comment, but I think you said that it's pretty well solid that those are coming in. Sean, do you have a comment on that? Um, no, Paul would know better. I mean, we it, it, the commitment is in writing, um, but I again- just, I just didn't know how things are changing budget-wise at the state level at this point um, with everything that's going on with the COVID you know, pandemic, so. But right. I, I and I, I don't either. I, I know there would be a huge ripple if the state were to recalculate chapter 90 because that's a lot of moving parts for a lot of big, big cities and towns. Yeah. Understood. But they don't always do this. I mean, they've consistently done whatever it is, 90 million. The same. Yeah, a consistent amount. But um, one year they didn't do the full amount. Another year they did 150% of the full amount. You know, I think it's consistent to get it, but I just don't know if we can borrow against it or borrow anticipation of it without some kind of letter from the state. Okay. Heidi, I know you're on here. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, this would be new for me for borrowing, doing an anticipation note on chapter 90. I know it's been done in the past, but I am kind of concerned where it's not an approved amount, whether we can borrow for it. Okay. I think we'd want to get clarification from Heidi that we actually could do that before before we do it. I, I agree, I think Lake Street's a great, a perfect project for it, but I just wanna make sure those funds are secured. Let me ask, can we do the shimming um, under our existing FY20 or under the existing capital funds? And just the only thing at risk is the um, is the chip seal. And that's kind of the same thing that we did on uh, Hunting Lane there. We did actually waited uh, seasons between the uh, shimming and the chip seal. Well, the, I, I actually looked at that and I, I, I don't have a hard number, but the so essentially the Pleasant Street um, chip sealing won't be done. I mean, they're probably gonna do them at the same time. They typically like to come in and chip seal everything they're gonna chip seal, um, especially with the same product. So they'll be both in fiscal 21. So Pleasant Street money that's committed won't all be used. Um, and, and the shimming, I, I didn't break it out for you guys on that sheet, but the shimming is about half, um, I mean, yeah, it's about half of the money. Uh, I'd certainly be willing to support or even authorize the shimming this fiscal year if it doesn't require any FY21 funds. That is not that much risk and the shimming helps uh, fill in the holes and, and seal up where the water's infiltrating the you know asphalt cracking. Paul, I see you're back. Do you want to finish your thought that, that you started? Yes, yeah, so we're we're making a push to get more money. Uh, Paul, you're still having to say that that's part of economy is part of public. Paul, I think we're still having audio issues with you. We can't hear what you're saying. It's all broken up. Um, so, so I guess uh, we should make a motion. Uh, I guess the only thing I'm hesitant on is not being certain on the chapter 90. I think we can make a motion subject to chapter 90 being approved for the for fiscal tw fiscal year 21. Can we do that. Jeff, what do you, Jeff, Chuck, Eric, what do you think? Well, I'm listening to what Eric said. Is uh, Eric's um, point cuz cuz what is being done um Sean for Pleasant Street I see the number up there 252 is that also a shimming and chip seal but that's being covered by fiscal year 20 we already have that money I understand that that's what I'm wondering if we used part of the, did all of the shimming there and delayed the chip seal and used 
did all the shimming on different roads. I think he has to rebuild Pleasant, so that's a different. Oh, but, that's yeah. It's a complete but, rebuild. Pleasant getting rebuilt, but the, the the chip ceiling will be in fiscal twenty one. It, it, there's no way it's going to happen before July first. Okay. Um, and it it's perfectly acceptable to just approve uh, the shimming on this, and and also. Um, we, we're not going to do a, a, a Chapter 90 road project without approval from the um, the Chapter 90 office. Um, so you can you 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 can note that in the, in the motion. Um, okay, so we would we would do this subject to the final approval of the fiscal year 21 Chapter 90 commitment. You're saying um, the well, yeah, the 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 full job, yeah. But you got to give me approval to call the contractor and give them the okay to shim it. Now we're going to shim it in May. That's that that won't be in twenty one. Um, so I'm trying to think of a way to. I'm just, uh, Darren, do you have a suggestion? Uh, You're muted. If you could, yeah, if you could unmute I, no, I, so, um, well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone healthy and safe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you need to do it contingent. The project, the work's going to be done before you get the chapter 90 commitment. So I don't think that works. I think what John was saying is every time he, he does a project that's paid for with chapter 90 fund. He needs to submit paperwork that gets approved. So I think it's subject to the approval of the use of chapter 90 funds. And I think that will cover you. Sean, does that sound right to you? Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, you said that a lot better than I did. <laughs> and you'll remember last, last meeting, I, I gave you one of the many forms as a state, uh, this state aid re reimbursable, the preliminary estimate, that's what I gave you last time. There's several other forms that our um, Mass DOT rep signs off on when he approves a project. Uh, so it's exactly that, Darren. I, and he wouldn't be approving that if it wasn't within our, our um, it, within our allotment. He, okay. that, that doesn't mean they'd cut us the check right away, but they're going to, they'll approve it. And again, I can I can hold back and and uh, probably keep it from where we actually have to borrow the money. Paul, did you are you back on audio? Uh, David has sent me a message to call in. I I don't have that phone number. If he could repeat it, you're you're on now. I can hear you fine. So we hear you fine now, Paul. Oh, you can. Yep. All right. So. I was trying to say before that the chapter 200, chapter 90 funds are at 200 million. We're trying to increase that. We don't want to hold him up until those funds are actually available because they won't be available for a while and he needs to be able to get started. That's why you borrow in anticipation of the money. There should have been a letter already issued to the town. So Heidi should be able to do something with the letter the commitment letter that's already been issued. Okay. Heidi, do you have that letter? No, I haven't seen that letter, but I will look for it. I'll okay. ask. I'll ask where it is. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I have it. You have it, Sean. Okay, great. If you could get that to Heidi, that would be great. Okay, so do I have a motion then, Paul? Do you want to make, I, I don't even know what the motion's gonna say here, so. The motion is to approve the chip ceiling, the, uh, the, uh, shimming. shimming. Why don't I have, what, Eric, why don't you do it? <laughs> I, I as well have difficulty on doing the contingent part, but the, uh, the motion is actually to approve the, um, the shimming and the chip ceiling on the uh, overall roadway improvements as proposed in uh, the Director of Public Works backup backup material on uh, Lake Street. And are you looking for Everett and Prospect as well? No, Eric, no, just Lake. Just okay. Lake for now. Okay, on Lake Street. And then Paul might want to add something about if it's contingent funds. Contingent, so, oh, go ahead. 
subject subject to the approval by Mass DOT for Chapter ninety funds. For Chapter ninety funds. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Like a for that three-way motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take a vote. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Mr. Jan. Aye. Mr. Dorensis. Aye. I also vote aye, so five zero. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry that's a little confusing. Oh, not a problem. All right, so the next item on our agenda is a consideration of items in response to COVID-19 local emergency. The first, various due date extensions and related relief measures First issue we want to talk about is the property tax due date, which is currently at May 1st. Um, and I think, Paul, I know you wanted to talk about this. And let yes. So if I could, uh, we have been hearing from our tax collector. And I want to say that the job of the tax collector is to collect taxes and that and she does that well but there's a bigger picture and the reason why this vote is for the board of selectmen is that we're supposed to provide balance to the issue and as part of that balance and as part of the role that we have here i would say a few things the first, this week, we have had hundreds of people in this town without power or telephone and sometimes without cable. We don't know how many people in the town have lost jobs or have been furloughed. What we do know is there is a crisis and that we are in uncertain times. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know that the general court and the governor who have more knowledge than we do have looked at this and have come up with these proposals to benefit all of us. If you look at those proposals, you need to compare them to what other levels of government have done. The federal government has postponed taxes three months. The state government has deferred taxes for three months, the general court and the governor is proposing one month or 30 days, one third what the other two levels of government have done. We currently have a stay at home order rather than pushing people to go to town hall, to file the papers, to go to banks, to do all those things. We're supposed to be living in a different world today. So with the future so uncertain and with the, the prospects for all kinds of bad things to happen economically to the citizens of our town, and of the Commonwealth, I think the question for us is, what are we going to do to help the people of the town? And for those reasons, I'm advocating that we approve the one month extension and that we approve all other of the three items that the legislature has put together for the benefit of all the people of the town and all the people of the Commonwealth. All right. Um, I'm also going to ask Nancy Hess. Uh, I know we've seen a lot of emails from you. I'd like to hear what you have to say about this, Nancy. 
Well, as I put forth in my emails, um, I think it will do the, the town harm if we don't keep the May 1st due date of basically forcing banks and mortgage companies to come forward and make the payment. But I, I would ask you to maintain that May 1st deadline and not vote on the rest of that until a later meeting. I have tried to work with someone about a, uh, a, a private public uh, uh, arrangement where um, this person has uh, generously offered to help people in need as far as the um, as far as the interest is concerned and this would give us more control because we, if we accept the other uh, the state thing we can't put any kind of uh, it's, it's all it's for everybody or, or nobody whereas if we uh, accept this um, offer to help pay interest for people who are um, in a position where they've lost their job or something like that we we can save ourselves from having to borrow which will cost everybody including the people who are having trouble paying and the people who have already come forward and paid we have uh, millions of dollars that people have have paid so i i would ask you not to vote on the other options but to maintain the may 1st so that we can at least get the collections in that people who are, can afford it will pay and not delay that and the banks and mortgage companies will be required to pay um, and that way we will probably be able to avoid borrowing any significant money to make it through we have to remember that most of these communities that are adopting this uh, moving of the date are communities that are on quarterly billing so they have half of their money already to pay their bills we do not because our last date was in november so um, that puts us um, at, at, in more of harm's way uh, financially than uh, than these other communities so and if i if my source is accurate dover just voted at their selectmen's meeting to maintain the May 1st um, collection date to force the banks and mortgage companies to pay. So as long as we keep that date, they are obligated to pay the taxes for their escrow accounts. If we move the date, they're only obligated to meet that uh, new date. So um, I would strongly urge you, you have, a, you have a meeting later in the month, I would strongly urge you to keep the May 1st date and then reassess what where we are and have a chance to go over this um, this um, proposal that we have for um, having some private help uh, for those people who are financially in trouble. Thank you Nancy. Heidi can you add I know you've looked into the um, the financial implication of, of different things so if you could just add to this I'd appreciate it. Sure thank you George. Uh, I fully understand Paul's wishes to help everyone in the resident, I think with the residents, and I think we all would like that, but I also feel we have an obligation to help the town as a whole, and what we've been really struggling to is stabilizing and working in a, getting a better financial shape and picture. Um, my concern with borrowing a second revenue anticipation note this year, um, yes, we can explain the story about what went on and that we are moving to quarterly but however it's still going to sit out that we borrowed twice you're not only going to borrow money but you're going to be short on the interest so it's actually going to be a greater greater gap um, that the cost had to be made up someplace when we passed to all the town residents via taxes at some point anyway um, so i i agree that we want to benefit everyone but i think we need to really look at the whole town uh, the cost I've tried to limit what would be the smallest amount we could we could borrow, and we probably have to go about 2.5 million. Cost to borrow that will be about 8,600 dollars, and then you have the revenue loss from the interest side as well, and that will get passed on to the taxpayers at some point. 
Um, I believe the banks you know, have been sitting, they've collected the escrow, and I don't think we should lose that opportunity not to bring in the revenue that the banks already have if it means that we don't have to borrow. And if we kept the May 1st date, we would not have to borrow the funds. I think we will get enough in. Thanks, Heidi. I, I just want to add to this. I'm just talking to some people today. I reached out to um, some high officers at a few, a number of banks just to see what their policies are in regard to escrows, because I think that's a significant amount of money uh, that will, a, a significant number of residents have mortgages and their taxes are paid by their mortgage company or their bank. And if the due date is stay, stays at May 1st, the bank is obligated, whether there's interest forgiveness in the future or not, the bank is obligated to pay that escrow money by May 1st. Like they're, they're on an automated system, that's gonna happen if we leave the due date at May 1st. And that's, that's money that all of us who have mortgages and money in those escrows, that's our money that's just sitting in the bank and there's no reason why the town shouldn't have that money as opposed to the banks just sitting on it for another month because we moved the due date. Um, so I'm I'm more on this on the idea that we keep the due date the same and we revisit the forgiveness of interest and penalties later on for people who are having a hardship. Chuck, do you want to add? Yeah, no, I I support that approach and um, uh, in large part because one of the first points that Paul made, which is at this point we really don't know the full impact. I I particularly don't want the banks to have the benefit of um, our residents, you know, prepayment on uh, t t tax and insurance costs that that money should be in our coffers, not theirs. I'm also just concerned down the road. I, you know, we, I don't want us to delay having to pay people or reduce hours. So I think we'll have a much better idea of that to Paul's point. Uh, we'll have a much better idea of the impact of, uh, um, and, and, and where we are. I think we need to be data driven and at this point we don't have a lot of data, so. Jeff? Jeff, do you have anything to add? Oh, I'm sorry, I was, uh, I didn't, hear you. I, uh, no, I, I think I am supportive of, of uh, what you recommended, George. I, I don't think I'm in favor of changing the date, but I would like to make the provisions that, um, we can to make that Nancy and Heidi have suggested to help people that need help. So, mm -hmm. and I didn't know if you wanted, I, I was wondering maybe if Stephen Leahy's on, if advisory had any position also. Yeah, I'll ask Eric if he has any comments just so all the board members can say something and then I'll, then I'll go to Steve if he's on here. It, just to reiterate what you said, those of us with mortgages, which is definitely the majority of the houses in town have paid our taxes. It's just a matter of allowing the uh, make forcing the banks to release those taxes. I agree with that. Be nice. I, I'm going to estimate probably seventy percent have that. I would be a little interested in how we how you would execute kind of a a relief. You know, it would just kind of be at application. We could get a thirty day relief for those that don't have escrows. Do you know what I mean? Those that pay out of pocket for for either biannual or quarterly taxes. Do you just simply apply for a relief of the uh, penalties? Nancy, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't have time to present this to you so that it would be formal. I literally just took the phone call while you were meeting um, because I was waiting and the person apologized to hear from this person. I had presented to them um, because they had offered to help. Um, helping us relieve the, the interest for taxpayers who would write to us and tell us that they lost a job or that they had they were in financial difficulty to ask us to help relieve the interest on their tax bill and we can either set up a committee or we can work out the details of this down the road but they've offered a generous amount of money i have certain latitude uh, it's a small amount but if it's the average tax bill uh, i can forgive some of the money that will get us through uh, a piece of the um, the first the initial thing and they've offered a generous amount of money to help pay that interest for people who need it which will mean that the town will get the interest it just won't come from the taxpayer it will come from this generous donation 
we talked about trying to use tax aid money, but the tax aid money has already been distributed. And we talked about other ways of trying to fund something that would give this relief without getting the automatic two month thing by adopting one of these other um, things that the state has offered. I think this is a win-win for the town, but as I say, we have time to put a formal thing together if you hold off on voting on any of the interest stuff until we get a chance to put an actual program together that you all can approve. Okay. Stephen Leahy, are you on here? Can you, you have a comment? Uh, not much comment to add other than um, from my understanding of the issue, it seems that um, Paul Dorensis's goal of helping anyone who's in financial hardship is certainly admirable. I don't think that moving the due date for um, residential real estate payments would be the most effective way to do that now. I agree with many of the points made previously, and so um, I would not be in favor of making that change at this point in time. To Paul's overall point, if I may, um, the Sherman Advisory Committee has initiate a process to go back to a number of the department heads in town with regards to the fiscal year 2021, their budgets and capital items. Uh, and we are speaking to a number of the departments about their operating budgets, about their capital requests for fiscal year 21. Great. So if I could, George, yeah, say a couple of things. First, uh, uh, with, to uh, Stephen Leahy, I, I do have a proposal later on that we do two town meetings, one that would just do basically articles one through nine, which is the operating budget, and to put off essentially all of the capital unless we can identify something that's so, so uh, in such an emergency that it has to be done right away. So all the capital articles off to the fall. And so I would hope that the uh, budget that we're going to actually end up adopting will be more reflective of the huge impact that the economy is facing and not the one that we were originally looking at. So that's point number one. Point number two, the idea that someone had of waiting until April 30th and then reassessing this, well, the taxes are due on May 1st. And having a meeting the night of the 30th is too late. You're going to have people who are stressed out. There's enough stress going on in this world trying to deal with this disease. Some of us have family members who have this disease. It's not an easy thing to deal with. Then to have to be worried about uh, uh, the tax bill and what the Board of Selectmen might do on April 30th is just not fair to them. I, I, th I think this needs to be uh, clear well in advance. And then uh, the argument that we need to keep the town from harm, I think uh, misses the, the biggest point, which is that the town exists to serve its people rather than the people exist to serve the, the town. And to the extent that uh, uh, we have to benefit someone, I would opt to benefit the people of the town first, rather than worry about the effect of 30 days deferral on receiving some taxes. The town is not going to end or go out of business because taxes are deferred 30 days. But the upcoming recession over the next uh, five, six, seven months, that could be a serious issue not only for our residents, but also for the town. And that's, that's an issue for advisory in, in connection with the upcoming budget. So for all those reasons, uh, I think it's a mistake to rely on private donors to, to uh, uh, come forward and, 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 and take care of people. I think it's humiliating to ask people to prove <clears throat> that they are having financial hardship and disclose what their loss of employment is or their loss of income is and all of those kinds of things. I think we need to move beyond that. And as I've said before, if, uh, if Donald Trump 
can do three months, and if uh, Charlie Baker can do three months, for us to do 30 days seems very small in comparison. So for all those reasons, uh, while I respect the views of, that have been expressed by my colleagues, I'm, I am going to uh, vote to put people first. Eric? I actually fully agree with Paul that the government does serve to serve the people. That is uh, why we created the government. I don't agree, though, that it serves to serve the banks. And given that probably 70 to 80 percent of all the uh, um, houses are single family residents in town are paid via escrow for taxes that we have already paid. Um, and so I don't support a blanket, just relief to it. I would support a more liberal application process. I kind of see what Paul says about you know, having to prove a hardship. Because even if, you know, even it's not gonna happen, but if every single person who doesn't have a mortgage doesn't pay, you know, if the, if the cost is 8,500 or whatever it was, or $8,000 for the full town, then you're probably looking at like one to $2,000 cost. And that might not be the end of the world if we're pretty liberal on allowing relief for non-escrow um, payments. Just a thought. I I agree with you, Eric. I think we're, I'm in support of, you know, really looking hard at the interest relief for anybody between, you know, the, after May 1st, but I don't want to move the deadline from May 1st because I want the banks obligated to pay and everybody's escrow agreement with their bank says they're obligated to pay by the due date. So I think, as you said, that's going to get us 70% of our tax revenue right there by May 1st and we won't have to borrow. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm in support of leaving it at May 1st and, and then re-examining hard, not even so much a people have to prove that they're having a hardship just, but if people are, you know, miss the payment of June, for, I mean, of May 1st, we, we have some forgiveness for interest. Yeah, and you can make it a liberal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I do kind of get Paul's thing about the embarrassment of proving a hardship or whatever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially if it becomes public record in any fashion. So, on that note, I think if, if we're in support of leaving it on May 1st, we don't have to make a motion. But, Paul, did you want to make a motion? Sure, I want to be on record. Uh, so, I would move to... Uh, defer the uh, taxes by the full 30 days. And if somebody would give me the courtesy of a second, then we could take a vote and you could vote it down. If that's the will of the board. I'll give the second. Okay. Having a motion and a second, um, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Paul Durant. Just one other point that we, the choice isn't between zero and 30. We can do two weeks, we can do three weeks, we can do 30 days. I'm, the, mo the motion I made was for the max. For the 30 days, right. Oh, okay. 30. All right, Paul, uh, Mr. Dorensis, go ahead. Yes, I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Johnson? I vote nay. Mr. Waldron? Nay. Mr. Yan? No. Mr. Morrill, I vote no. So it's defeated one to four. Um, do we have do we have any other motions on this item? Well, I'd like to move to Until April 30th to vote to look at those next two motions. Yes, I'd like to move to uh, to uh, forgive with uh, uh, interest. We have motions in the packet, Paul, if you wanted to, did you see those? I do, but I can't, I can't do both the oh, Zoom conference and the motions at the same time. <laughs> They're on the same, the same. Sorry. Um, so yeah, the motion reads, Paul, you can just say so moved. The second motion reads, I move that the board vote pursuant to section 11 of chapter 53 of the acts of 2020 to waive the payment of any interest or other penalty in the event of a late payment of any excise tax, betterment, assessment, or appropriate appropriation 
thereof water rate, annual sewer use, or other charge added to a tax, provided that the due date for such payment was March 10th, 2020 or later, and the payment owed is made no later than June 30th, 2020. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. So on a discussion on that, go ahead, Eric. And just so I understand it, because you know what Nancy talked about about the uh, what's called the burden of proof or whatever is uh, to apply for it. Does it make that essentially just open? I, mean, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, this this motion leaves it open, so anybody who doesn't pay automatically gets their interest waived. Nancy, do you want to comment on that? I know you kind of. I think you raised your hand there. Yes, um, that's exactly it. And as I uh, mentioned before, we have six hundred and ninety nine accounts open. And if I were a taxpayer and was told that I would not have to pay interest regardless, I would certainly hold on to my money for another month. And we have people, as, as I, I've explained uh, in the past, May 1st of last year, we took in over a million dollars from people who can pay. Now, if people can't pay and they know that we're going to have a public private effort to cover their interest, that should give them some relief. It's just that we need to work out the details of how that's going to happen. And I have no um, attachment to draconian uh, measures of uh, assessing people's need. But, um, but I do know there is a finite amount of money, which should take us pretty well through if, if the people who need help are people with an average tax bill, we should be able to go pretty nearly through the month of May um, with uh, people of need. Now, if people who don't have need apply out of that 699 people, we definitely will not be able to, but I don't know why you can't at a later time adjust and, and adopt a, a, a broader measure if you, if you want to. So I would I would say not to make that commitment now to re reassess where we are as we get closer to the to the um, May due date. Okay. Uh, Sanford Lane, I know you had a question. Hi, it, I'm Karen Lane. Um, I'm an attorney, but this is not my ballywick. But I don't believe that it's legal um, or constitutional that you can separate the mortgage holders out from the people who do not have mortgages and therefore give um, relief to the non-mortgage holders if you need it, but don't give relief to the mortgage holders. And right. I think someone who that's, not, that's not what we're proposing. We voted to keep the due date for everyone May 1st. But we're saying, we're saying by doing that, anybody with a mortgage, their bank is obligated to pay by May 1st. Other people that are paying without a mortgage, they're still, their tax payment is still due May 1st. And if they choose not to pay, there's a there's a chance that you know down the road we may waive any interest or penalties if they don't. And that's what I'm saying. You, I do not think it's legal that you can waive the interest and penalties for the non-mortgage holders versus the mortgage holders. Well, well, there's a state statute that that was passed due to the COVID pandemic that we can actually waive interest and penalties for anyone who doesn't pay by May 1st, if we, if we adopt this statute, that it would, ex we can waive any interest and penalties for our, between March 10th and June 30th. Mm. That's what, that's the, that's the statute that we're under mass state law section 11 of chapter 53 of the acts of 2020 there, we can adopt, if we decide to adopt that, we can waive those penalties and interest for anybody who doesn't pay by May 1st. And the penalties are also waived for the banks, but the banks as a due course of business are going to still pay on the due date. So it's really not selective. It's not saying those who don't have a mortgage have it waived. I believe that it's waived for everyone, but the, yeah. but the banks as a course of business are still going to meet the due date. They're obligated uh, with their contract with the um, mortgage holder, I yeah. believe, to actually pay on the due date. They are, that's essentially, the, that's the with the essentially bank. not penalizing non-compliance. Right, Chuck, you have a comment? Yeah, the, um, the distinction is based on whether or not somebody is paid by the due date, not what, not how, whether they have a mortgage, whether or not they prepaid their uh, 
taxes and insurance through a mortgage company, the, the distinction is based on whether or not somebody is paid. It's not on their status as holding or not holding a mortgage. Correct. However, you realize that everyone who is paying in this town by mortgage, because we're at in April right now, their mortgages interest is for taxes is already escrowed. So they're going to be paid by the banks. And I'm not in disagreement with, with you all doing what you're doing because it's so close in time. But what are you going to do afterwards? What are you going to do for the next payment? And this is where I'm in agreement with um, Mr. Dorensis that I don't think the town understands um, what is going on financially. And someone said before, this needs to be data driven. Um, the small business owners in town, um, the loans have been cut off as of today. There's no more money uh, for the PP loans. There's no more money for the idle loans. Um, and that I'm, I'm an attorney who does work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The courts are closed. I also do have, have my private clients, but the courts are closed. And there is not one sole practitioner as a lawyer that I am aware of who is really working right now. Um, because the courts are closed. We, we can't go in to see our clients. Our, and there, I would like to see maybe a data-driven survey in this town of, of how many people are actually af affected rather than people having to go, as Mr. Dorenz has said, with their hat in hand and feel humiliated to ask for relief. Because I don't think people in this town are going to be very willing to do that. They're going to be very embarrassed, and they're going to—they are—they're going to just suck it up. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Nancy, I see your hand up. I—I I think that we have to make it clear that if we move the due date of the tax bill, it also gives a pass to the banks and mortgage companies not to pay. They are only obligated to pay by the due date. So by keeping our due date May first. It will obligate those banks who have your tax money already to give it to the town so that the town can function. And as far as relief afterwards, you can adopt this later if you decide to do that, or we can take another route. As I say, we have a very generous donation to help and how you want to administer that we can talk about later. We just don't have time to talk about it now. So I would urge you to just stay with keeping the the tax date May 1st, and then addressing the interest issue later. There's nothing unconstitutional about that. It, we've done our research on it. And, um, and I think that that's the best way to go for everybody, not just the people who can't pay, but for the people who have paid and for the, to have the money come to be able to pay our bills from those um, banks and mortgage companies who already have the money that should be turning it over to the town. Marion Nutra, do you have a question? You gotta unmute Marion, hold on just a second. She's self muted, I can't unmute her. Okay, there she goes, go ahead Marion. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the woman with Sanford, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Terrell. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, but I think, uh, and certainly I appreciate Paul's comments, but I think the May 1st deadline is the best way to go for all the reasons you say, but between now and May 1st is a very short time. And you want to be sure that people who have lost their work don't have to apply uh, and, you know, call themselves out, if you like. So in the next two weeks, I was just, my my tech, my chat was uh, that it may be good tonight to outline a plan for publicizing this relief to the town far enough in advance of May first, so people who aren't in a bad situation are not stressing over this uh, between now and May first because it's only two weeks away. So that just just to kind of get back on track here, the motion in front of us, we've already voted that we're going to keep the date May first. 
Right. The motion in front of us is whether we're going to waive any interest or penalties between March 10th and June 30th. That's that's what we're talking about now. We already have determined that we're keeping the tax payment due date as May 1st. All right. Okay. Well, I apologize. I was just thinking one step ahead. Once you've made this next decision, yeah. you have okay. to get it out to the town. Yeah. He Heidi's had her hand up for a while too, I think, George. Oh, I, oh, I didn't see that. I'm sorry, Heidi. Did you want to add something? Yes. I was, I was going to say, for compromise, can you, because you've already kept the due date to May 1st, can you do 30 days interest forgiving? I think, Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the statute is is what all it is. Or nothing. It's all or nothing. You go to June thirtieth or yeah. or not. Darren, you're muted. Sorry. David, can you unmute Darren? No, he's self muted. I can't unmute oh, him. Darren, unmute yourself. I apologize. I was I was looking at uh, the the uh, law actually. Um, yeah, you, 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 the forgiveness would have to go to June thirtieth for for yeah. any interest and fees and penalties between now and June 30th. Okay. Between um, actually when the COVID crisis began and June 30th. Eric, did you have a question? I think I- Yeah, actually Heidi, Heidi stole it. I was gonna recommend a motion too with a June 1st deadline, but I guess not. Um, Paul? Yes, I just wanted to ask Nancy a couple of questions about her presentation about people who paid and not paid. She said, there were 699 people who hadn't paid. Who had and not. I had not. And I always had the impression that there was like 1,420 houses in the town. So that suggests to me that more than half the people have already paid their taxes as of the state. That, that's, we've had inquiries from banks and I have been able to say to them that the May, the May 1st deadline was still in place. So we have had some payments from some of the mortgage companies. And we have had some taxpayers who have stepped up and paid their taxes, but we still have a very large number and some of them are very significant tax bills. So uh, it's not the average taxpayer that's still out there and they're often the people who wait to the last uh, time so that they can keep their money invested and so forth. So. I don't think we're going to car, ca, uh, cause them any harm. I think that the people, the people who um, cannot pay, who are really um, having a hard time, um, are if this little bit of time is not going to help them be able to produce their tax bill. And this does not forgive tax; it only forgives interest. So, and we have. Um, we, we, as I say, we have a generous donor who is willing to help with some of that, how we administer it, whether it's you know first come, first serve or whatever. Um, we can talk about the detail of that and you'll still have time to adopt the total forgiveness if you don't think that will work out. But for tonight, I'm asking you not to do anything about interest because it will only discourage the payment of taxes by the people who actually can pay. Well, if I, 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 just, a, just a second, Paul. I have a couple of, I've got a backup of questions here. First, I had Daryl Beardsley. Daryl? Let's see if I can find you, Daryl. Where are you? There she is. You're self muted also. Daryl, could you unmute? All right. I thought you were just going to read oh, it. Sorry. <laughs> go, <laughs> no, go, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll read my question. I didn't know if the whoever is receiving the payments can tell just by virtue of however the payment is made and where it's reported as coming from, whether it's coming from a bank or mortgage company. And if that's the case, then it's you can sort of be silent on the other in terms of not making people come forward and apply and whatever else. Yeah, I think I think with this with this statute, it would you there would be no application process. It would literally just waive the interest for anybody who didn't pay before June thirtieth. Okay, great. That's um, it. Okay, and Jackie, I think are you muted? There yeah, you I was just curious um, what the what the average interest would be. You know, what's the uh, on our average tax bill in town? We can't be talking about a ton of money per tax bill, what would well, it be? 
if we're talking about uh, the average tax bill of a, around eight thousand dollars we're yeah. talking about i don't have the paperwork in front of me but i did work this out about three dollars and sixty some odd cents a day okay so we're like like a hundred dollars or so yeah yeah but that's for each taxpayer so depending right. on whether we have right. 600 or we have 200 it makes a significant difference yeah. darren darren did you have something you wanted to add yeah very quickly and it may have already been said but just just to be clear the june 30th time that we're talking about to qualify for the waiver the, the taxes would need to be paid by june 30th to qualify right for the right if they haven't paid, let me make sure that if, if they haven't paid by june 30th my understanding is the interest and penalties go back to may 1st that's correct that is correct yeah um, can i ask a clarifying question then george go ahead Jeff. How will we communicate this to people? In other words, let's say that we keep it at May 1st and we're willing to, through this philanthropic source or whatever source, uh, pay interest for the month of May effectively for people that can't afford it. How will we let them know that now so that they're not like scrambling to try and come up with the money because they didn't know that they could um, defer it for 30 days? <laughs> Chuck, your cat's got a, que got a question. But my cat's been in more Zoom meetings in the last month than it ever has before. So <laughs> I can't silence him though. <laughs> Go ahead, Nancy. Did you have an answer to Jeff's question? Well, I think you'll have to use the same. Uh, we have next door Sherburn. We have the the website, or we, depending on the number of people, uh, we could try to reach out to people. But. Um, but again, until we know where we are, we really aren't going to know the best way to address that issue. Um, I understand, but if we don't communicate, then people won't know that it that there's this support available. To Paul's point earlier, is we want to try and support the people that need support. If they don't know that it's out there, then we can't help them. Well, I get phone calls from people, and um, if people are concerned, they usually will call. All right. Uh, I have a question from Wendy Alassi, our, our uh, director of assessors. Wendy, do you can you unmute? Where are you, Wendy? Let me find you. There she is. Okay. Yep. Wendy. Yes. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good evening. Um, I was just wondering in, I believe in this um, new legislation, one of the questions that was also proposed is if the town would like to allow um, an extension for um, allowing municipalities to extend the deadline for property tax exemptions and that deferrals and those come in through our office, is, does that go hand in hand with no, that's, the tax bills. That's Wendy, a there's, a, there's a third motion that that we have potentially that we're going to. Oh, you have that, it. Okay, great. That, okay, for yeah, abatements and exceptions, it. that that's the yep, that's yep. a third motion. Okay, and I'll jump in on that if you want. Okay, great. And, Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. And George, that reminds me too that if we if we do this extension where we don't have people paying until the 29th of June, they will already have received their first tax bill for fiscal 21 because we'll be on quarterly so that will just add more misery to the people who can't pay okay. i don't know as people are aware that that first tax bill comes out the end of june right okay so we have a motion whether we want to defer the interest and penalties um do we have any more discussion amongst the board just paul just the point that i was trying to make with my question to nancy that 699 taxpayers have already paid. And she has indicated that many of those were mortgage banks. So that in essence, with uh, 1,420 um, homes in the town, th that we have had a significant number, almost half of the taxpayers have already paid their taxes. 
I didn't ask what the amount that was paid, but I thought I saw a memo from our finance director that we received like five million or or six million or somewhere in that area between five and six million already in in taxes from these bills so and there was also was a statement that we don't um, we don't have the uh, uh, benefit of the first half of the taxes but if we're paying if we set a bill in November and we do have the, the payments from November when you have a semi-annual system, you get 50% of your taxes up front. Where you have quarterly, you only get 25% of your taxes in the first round, then you get your 50%, then you get your 75%. So the difference isn't all that significant, particularly where it's only 30 days. So on the question of, of waiving the interest and penalties, we simply need to do something for our people and to take this hard nosed position on all of these motions I, I i don't think serves the the people of the town well the idea of a donor coming forward that's that's commendable that somebody said that they would do it but i bet you there's nothing in writing i bet you there's been no contract signed no money's been deposited in some bank somewhere and, and if the donor is thinking, well, this is going to be uh, like uh, $10,000 and it turns out to be a million dollars, I'm wondering where that money would still be there. So that just doesn't seem to me to be, have enough reality to it that it even should be part of the discussion at all. Okay. So back, just having a board discussion at this point, Nancy, because I think we've had a lot of other questions and comments and I want to kind of keep moving here. We've got a lot more agenda to get through. Um, Jeff, Eric, Chuck, do you have anything else to add before we vote on this motion? Did we get a second on it? Yeah, we have a second. Jeff, okay. Jeff seconded it. Um, I have nothing to add. Okay. All right, so I'll take a roll call vote on the motion to defer the interest payments. Uh, Mr. Durensis. Votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Mr. Yan. No. I'll vote aye. So vote by a vote of four to one, we'll defer the interest payments through June 30th. Um, Paul, did you have a third motion you wanted to make? Yes, to extend the time for abatements and-, oh, and I, can read it. I can read it for you, Paul. It's, I move the board vote pursuant to section 10A of chapter 53 of the acts of 2020 to extend the due date for applications for abatement or exemption in accordance with GL chapter 59 sub, sub chapter 59 and GL chapter 59 sub chapter five from April 1st to June 1st, 2020. So in argument in favor, oh, I, I so moved. Okay, so moved, do I have a second? I'll second it, um, I just, just so we can have a discussion. Uh, Paul, do you want to get started? And I know Wendy wanted to add something to this, so go ahead. Okay. In addition to all the arguments about people having financial hardship, there's something else going on, and that is that there's this pandemic. And there are people in town who have this disease. There also are many of us who have relatives who have this disease. And so aside from all of the issues that one normally deals with in one's life, I can say from having a family member involved in this, that there's a lot of terror that goes with this disease. And to have people worried about filing paperwork and getting the paperwork right, and trying to figure out what deadline it is when they don't know if they're going to live or die just seems really extreme to me. So I, I, the purpose of this motion is to kind of relax things for, for all of those. I also understand that the numbers of people who are projected to get this disease, we're still, we haven't reached the peak yet, and there's still large numbers of people getting it. Middlesex County is a hotbed for this disease. 
So in addition to those who have lost their jobs and who are in turmoil over those issues, there are a lot of family issues and a lot of uh, uh, personal and medical issues that are affecting people. So why burden them with paperwork? Thank you, Paul. Uh, Wendy, did you want to add to this? Just unmute, please. There you go. Okay, uh, yes, so I just wanted to um, let you know that we receive for exemptions and deferrals, we receive everything in the fall. Um, so we've gone through the process. Um, it's just recently that they extended semi-annual to April 1st. Um, I actually do have an application that came in after April 1st, um, but there's a couple of things I'm thinking about. The income, and the benefit isn't based on their current year's salary, it, it, you know, or current year income or, or tax returns or anything. It's based on prior. So if they're having a hardship now, it wouldn't be due to the COVID. It would be due to last year. Um, but, you know, as far as us taking in applications, it would probably be a couple um, and, as far as the assessing department, if that's something that we can do um, to help the taxpayers, you know, I, we, you know, we will do whatever you ultimately decide to do. Um, and there will, there is plenty of money in the overlay to support additional deferrals or exemptions. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, do okay. I have other questions, comments? Discussion. If not, go ahead, Chuck. Oh, I was just going to, uh, uh, George. I was just going to say. I think the rationale for this actually uh, makes a, a, a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, the disruption and the difficulty in meeting a deadline like that is fine. It doesn't change the rationale and the basis for approving uh, an application for an, an abatement. So I, I would. Uh, I, 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 I hope the board will support this. I agree. All right. If do I have other, no other no further questions concerns, I will go to a roll call vote. Mr. Durantis. Votes aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Yan. Yes. Mr. Waldron. Aye. I vote aye. So by a vote of five to zero, motion three passed. Okay. So let's get back to the agenda. Hold on, I got that on my other screen. So uh, I have um, motions on town meeting. Is that the next? Can't... What's that, Paul? I want to make some motions about town okay. meeting. What can we, we? I'm trying to get to that. We that was. I'm going through the agenda. Um, the next, the next the item is bifurcated annual town meeting. Right. So go ahead. All right. So I I think given the economic projections that are going on, the effect on people across the state, including people in our town, and given the fact that people are getting sick, and the point I just made about the terror that goes with getting sick and not knowing whether you're gonna live or die, that we need to ease up on the financial burdens on our residents to the extent that we can. We also do not have reliable projections that the disease will be sufficiently ameliorated that we can have a, a nice long town meeting in which we can discuss you know the importance of zoning issues or all kinds of uh, uh, interesting issues that come up at town meeting. So the moderator made a proposal about taking the current warrant that I believe we haven't. We haven't maybe we, yet. No, we have not signed the warrant. So if we haven't signed the warrant, why, my idea, her, her idea was to take articles one through nine, which are the operating budget, basically. Do articles one through nine and essentially push everything else off until the fall. Yeah. The, Try to, trying to hold a town meeting is going to be difficult 
enough in June, even though we picked the date in June. We're probably still going to have to have social distancing. We may have to do this at an athletic field where people are well spread out. We have quorum requirements of at least 100 people. Which I think and we can actually, on that note, Paul, we can vote to change our quorum. I, heard we, I understand we can. And there are reasons to do that, and there's reasons not to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that why not do everything we can to simplify the town meeting? A, for the safety and welfare of the people who attend, many of whom, actually most of them, to my observation, are in the, the age bracket that is most susceptible to a really serious uh, adverse uh, 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 impact by this particular disease. And number two, because the financial situation is so uncertain, and while they're talking about reopening the economy, we don't know what that's all gonna mean and how it's gonna affect our taxpayers and their ability to pay. So deferring some of the, the, the capital items, which by the way, would also mean that we would uh, withdraw the override questions that we put on, temporarily put on the ballot and deal with all of this in September. Okay. Where okay. we can have a, a town meeting with meaningful discussion and without people being afraid to attend. Okay, thanks Paul. Um, let's, uh, Mary Wolf, I know you're on here. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this idea. I know you were the one that originally sent us the email on it, so. Yeah, um, I, I, I basically I agree with what Paul just said that um, if we are going to have a meeting, and we are, um, that we should try to limit the exposure of everyone in terms of time and space and so forth. And so if we can possibly cut the warrant. So here's, here's my question. Since the warrant hasn't been signed yet, we could simply um, make the warrant only those financial articles mm -hmm. that we want. What Dar Darren sent us an email to that effect, kind of, since we haven't signed the warrant, we can make a motion to accept the moderator's recommendation to only, that only the omnibus article, but I don't think we even need to, Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't even think we need to make a motion. We could just say, like, let's, let's talk about a revised, much shorter warrant, because yeah. I also want to still discuss, I know the capital items are on there now. It, I, I think we need to go through them with capital budget and with advisory and say, are there anything, are there, is there anything on here that's critical to Q1 of 21, or can they all be deferred to September? Yeah. So just very quickly uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, it, it, you could take a motion, uh, make a motion tonight, but you really don't have to. There is not a final approved warrant yet. So as you, when you do go to approve the warrant, you can approve whatever articles the board wants on the warrant and can choose not to have whatever articles that it chooses uh, to, to not be on the warrant and to, to wait in September because you don't have a final warrant yet. The only thing that I did add in my email is petitioned articles would need to be included. They've been properly petitioned onto the annual. Right, and I think we have one citizen's petition article, correct, Jackie? I think that's, um, but from what I heard, but I think she wants to um, have it withdrawn. Okay. Yeah. That's what That's I had heard. Understanding. And Steve Leahy could probably speak to that as well. Stephen? George, I want to suggest that uh, it'd be helpful to get Steve's input on this. And also, I want to make sure that Mary's uh, early April, I think it was like April 10th memo to this board is a public record. It was a very good memo summarizing the issues. Is that part? I, I just don't have the packet in front of me. Is that part of the? Yeah, uh, it is in our packet. So it's great. Just, so yeah. that's a public record. Just uh, Mary's uh, memo is a very good summary. Um, the one non-financial article that I think is time sensitive is the one we talked about earlier, which is Coolidge Crossing. Um, I would not like to delay, lose 
a summer in uh, potential construction uh, is such an important project for the town's taxes and SHI. Uh, but I thought her memo was very persuasive. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. If I could, George. Just a second, I want to hear from Stephen Leahy first. I know he's unmuted, so go ahead, Stephen. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, I would agree with all, all points earlier, you know, separating it into two separate um, town meetings. Fine by, by me, I was going to do a couple other members of the Sherman Advisory Committee. We're all in agreement. Mary Wolf, your, e your email was well put, very clearly written. Uh, I also agree with Chuck that if there is one non-operating budget item that we would would want to help encourage move quickly, that would be the Coolidge Crossing issue. Um, so I would like to see that on there as well. Uh, as far as capital goes, you know, the, all the capital items have been vetted through the Capital Budget Committee. Um, I believe they've all been through advisory as well. Um, great point that if there's anything critical that must be executed in quarter one of this year, 21, I'd ask, I, I'd ask that a note be sent to the budget department, the department head and or budget makers, noting that we're going to um, punt and do a secondary meeting and we put capital items there. But if they did have anything that was super time sensitive and critical for quarter one, that they let us know sooner rather than later. Yeah. We're looking at you, Sean. <laughs> uh, so, I don't think, do, I mean, what does everybody think on the, on the board, on the select board? Do you think we should make a motion or do you think we could just kind of work with our warrant and knock it down to these critical items? Well, if I could, since- Yeah, Paul, I'm go ahead. The one that's trying to push Mary's idea. I, I think we need to give instruction to uh, David Williams to redo the warrant, have those communications find out what's critical and what's not. I'm mindful, for example, that many pieces of interior construction, it's not a good idea to do right now. That's too contagious, too much of a source of infection. So those are the kinds of things that even if they're important should be put off to the healthier times. Yeah. But there may be something like a roof that's leaking that needs to be done right away. So someone needs to go through all of those to determine what's what's truly urgent and what's not so i would recommend that we have some formality to this to okay. instruct that administrator to re, to redo the warrant in an abbreviated form into two warrants let me it's, read the let me read the motion that darren suggested and i think this will work for you paul I'm, I move that the select board vote to accept the moderator's recommendation that only the omnibus budget article, the unpaid bills article, the fiscal year 20 supplemental appropriations article, and any other similar financially necessary articles in all legally petitioned citizen articles be included on the June annual town meeting warrant and that a September special town meeting will be scheduled for all other articles, including all capital expenditures. Well, I'm gonna so move with the, with the Chuck Yon anticipated amendment that yep. include the uh, the uh, crossing uh, uh, Coolidge crossing Coolidge. easement article yeah. I guess uh, I have a question George on the capital which is who knows what the fall is going to look like but if and I don't haven't studied the capital projects like I used to but if there are ones that the school is doing that they want to get done in the summer for September 1st, so they're not doing construction during the school year, we may want to do those. Who knows yeah. what next September school year is going to look like. But. I do know on the, on the warrant, uh, the region has no capital articles on the on That's the what warrant. I thought. But I'd, I'd have to look and see what Pine Hill has on there. So that's so, a good point. I think, I, think, I think maybe we should revise the article um, like that, pending capital, I mean, we can, we should go through the list of capital articles. Jackie, you gotta unmute. So I, I just have a question because, um, and Darren could probably answer this best, but we have 10 questions that are already supposed to go on the ballot. So if we have the, and right now, we're supposed to have the election by June 30th. Um, so people will be voting on that 
and have no idea, um, you know, what the money is or, or anything That's else. Why I want to withdraw this. If I could, sorry to interrupt. No, go, no, please answer. <laughs> my, my idea was to withdraw those and have that all voted on in September after the second town meeting in a special election. Sorry to burden you with that. Could we have, I have a suggestion on that. If we have a late September second town meeting, could we then have our those ballot questions on election day in November so we don't have to have multiple voting times? Could you, could we do that the same day as the national presidential election? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, you, you can do that. We'll, we'll have to look at doing multiple elections. So. Yeah. We just will have to look at the timelines. It, it may it may play into when you schedule your September town right. meeting to make sure that we have the the election within the required time frame. Yeah. After I just, we want, we don't want to have people going to the polls fifteen times this year. So. Well, Darren, so. <laughs> If the questions were already submitted, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. The questions were already submitted, so then um, I have not printed the ballots because I've been waiting to see what was going to happen with the election. So I wouldn't have to put those those ballot those questions on. Do not have to go then. Is that correct? Well, yeah. Correct. Correct. It, 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 I, I, I want to look into the. Pro You're correct. I I, I will want to look into the process just to see if a formal vote may be necessary for the board at the next meeting, but there, there, there will be a way to not go forward with it. Not okay. Yeah. Is there a question of uh, elected officials? Like, I think there's two select board, I mean, two board of health members up for election. Yeah, I mean, I think the town oh, election, we're, still, we're going to talk about that next, Jeff, but I think we would still have the election. We're just not going to have the capital, capital, okay. item, uh, Prop two and a half questions on that election. It would, we would still have the election in late June potentially. We're going to discuss it next for okay. all the open positions in town. I misunderstood. Yeah, and, and also, there is one question on there for the treasurer to be um, go from elected to appointed. So that would be one question that that would go on. Okay. But everything else, there's no contested races. And Stephen Leahy just texted me to say that the. Uh, Sherburn schools have three capital requests, only one of which affects the classroom. Okay. All right, I think we can go through the capital articles later, but I think we can make this motion that we did directing David to kind of reduce our warrant to only critical items. Um, do I have a second from Paul to revise motion? Chuck, okay. Uh, I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Dorensis. Can I ask a question? Oh, sorry, sorry, just a second, John. Mr. Johnson. Has a just one point discussion. Would it be part of this motion or be something separate to consider reducing the quorum? Because I, I would support a reduction of the quorum as we struggle to get 100 on a good day. And even in the fall, when we're talking about a second rebound of this virus and everything else, um, I think I would support the reduction of a quorum as well. Yeah, I, uh, Eric, I completely agree. I think it should be a separate motion, though. But I, 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 well, let's discuss that as a separate motion after this vote. And then we yeah, can, I'd like to hear Mary and Darren talk about that. What, Darren? I, I, I think it's too early to be, I, one, I, I am not aware that special legislation has been passed as of yet, reducing the quorum requirement. I think that's okay. one that's let, in the war. Darren, let us, uh, let I, us finish, Darren, let, the Darren, let us finish this question and then we'll discuss that. Um, so, as I started the roll call vote, Mr. Durensis? Votes aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Yan? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. I vote aye. So five zero. So we're going to split the warrant. Now let's talk about the reduction of quorum. So Darren, please go ahead. Or Mary. Actually, I'd like to hear from Mary Wolf first because she was the, I think she had sent us an email about this. Yeah, the, uh, the quorum, one of the things that you want to realize about, you can't vote it tonight anyway, because if you are considering uh, reducing the quorum, you have to publicize that for a, a period of seven days prior right. okay. to taking your vote. On the other end, within 10 days of the vote, you have to notify the state that you have voted to reduce the quorum. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, you could do it the next day, but you have to allow enough time sort of on the other end as well. But you, you can't vote the quorum tonight anyway. You could decide to publicize the fact that you are going to vote a reduction in the quorum or consider voting a reduction in the quorum tonight, but you can't take the actual vote. You can't actually do a vote until we get seven days notice. Correct. Okay. Darren, did you have anything to add to that? You're muted. All right, I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. Was that in, are you talking about, was that in any of the recent special legislation? Or are you talking yes. about just generally under chapter 39? No, I'm talking about special legislation. I, I, I would need to look into that. But I do agree that it's not, you, you need more notice than just tonight. Yeah, it's, they, they, it says seven days. I, I could, uh, I could probably even share it on the screen. Um, that's okay. I think if we need to give seven days notice, then we'll just plan on, you know, if we want to discuss it at our next meeting, we'll make sure we give notice prior to that meeting on April 30th. Paul? So I, I participated in a discussion elsewhere about reducing the quorum requirement to zero. And it, the, the prevailing argument was that if you have no quorum requirement at all, you actually increase attendance because you have this interiorum effect <laughs> by telling somebody that any one person, if he or she shows up, can dictate all the budgets, all of the appropriations, <laughs> all of the articles. And if you want to leave it to just one random person to show up, like I think uh, Elliot Taylor used to go to every meeting. <laughs> so if you want to stay home and you want to, the, that individual to go there and make all the decisions, don't go. And what happens is you get people to come even more than when you have a quorum requirement because everybody's concerned. We don't want to leave it to just one or two people to make these decisions. Well, that was Paul, we at least have five of us and nine of advisory. So we're going to have at least 14 people there. So just a quick thing, by the way, I actually know someone whose towns did that and, and the town escapes me. And uh, exactly what Paul said happened, happened. They got the best turnouts and they brought the quorum down to 10. <laughs> True. Right. Okay. I, I thought I read somewhere that you can't go below 25% of your normal quorum, but I, do, I tried to find that again and I couldn't find it. So I, I don't know, maybe I dreamed it. I'm not. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so I think we'll put off this quorum discussion till April 30th. And we'll move on to our next item, which is a consideration of town election date. Um, Jackie, do you want to add anything here? Or I guess, what do we want to do here? Um, no, I think, well, last meeting you guys had discussed possibly doing it on the 23rd of June. I just know that we're required, you guys are required um, to vote 20 days before so June 10th would be the last day to decide and June 30th is the last day that we could have the election. I think June 23rd makes sense because that's a week after we have the town meeting um, and it gets it in, you know, kind of the latest, one of the latest dates we can do on a Tuesday before June 30th. And what about other options on voting? Like, is there ways that people don't actually have to come to the polls, Jackie, or? Yeah, so um, we'll have to publicize a lot of early voting. Um, we'll do early voting and then people can absentee. It's, they sh I wish that they had made it just no excuse absentee balloting, but they didn't. But if you are afraid of getting the coronavirus, you can have an absentee ballot. So people can, can come in and vote in the polls. I'm required to do a minimum of four hours um, on election day, but I would say that I'm probably gonna be advertising a lot of early voting and a lot of absentee balloting. Okay. Yeah. Darren, 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 I was just gonna add that there was additional legislation uh, filed today just filed, it hasn't been passed yet. Um, that is, uh, that basically is, is seeking for early voting, but 
Um, Wait, we, uh, we lo I lost you. Yeah, we lost you there for a second, Darren. Could yeah. you repeat uh, that? There was, there was additional legislation filed today that is seeking there to be full mail-in voting, meaning not just for early voting, but for the actual voting as well, um, in addition to Oh, that has not passed yet. But as Jackie said, there is full mail-in for early voting right now. And does this, Darren and Jackie, does it require an affirmative vote of the select board in order to allow that expanded uh, uh, access to early voting? I don't, I don't, the summary that I got from the state, I didn't see that it required an affirmative vote by this board. No, it doesn't. Okay. No. Correct. I think we just, our, our only vote is to set the date and I would move that we set the election date for June 23rd. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote unless anybody has additional discussion. Uh, Mr. Dorensis? I'm gonna abstain because I'm a candidate in that election. Okay. Mr. Johnson? Well, I do have a question. So the June 23rd, that's just because of what we have a placeholder for town meeting, correct? So that would, would have, to, if we vote to move the town meeting, we're gonna vote to move the election as well? We've already voted to move the town meeting to June 16th. Yeah, so can we make it June 23rd? That maybe yeah. that's understanding. Well, the town election will be June 23rd. But don't we have to have the election after town meeting? It is. June 16th is the town meeting. June 23rd is the election. Okay, no, okay. I was just... All right, aye. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yan. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. I vote aye. So four to zero to one abstention. Um, the election will be June 23rd. Uh, let's see what's next on our list. Heidi. Tax revenue anticipation note. Heidi Doyle. Uh, George, could I go and move this to next week so we could take another week and see where we are with? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. On April 30th, we'll see where we're at, especially yeah. since we kept the date May 1st. Maybe, maybe this right. won't even be necessary. Right. Yeah, Heidi, I think given where we are on the interest rates, they should be paying us to take out this loan. So <laughs> your, your, your marching orders are to get it to zero or for them to pay us. I, it's, I, I tried. It's really funny. They said it's all over the board and they're saying average is like 2.15% right now. So go figure. <laughs> all right. Um, Finance Director, Budget Development Update. Sharon, are you on here? He was at the start. I yeah, that. I am. Hello, oh, can hi, you hear Sharon, me? How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, nothing has changed um, in the budget uh, since the last time we met. Um, it's it's still um, under $20. Um, but as Stephen mentioned, um, there are plans to reach out to um, many of the department heads um, to get there, to get them to reduce things. And, and maybe Stephen, you want to talk a little bit about what your plans are? Uh, thanks, Sharon. Sure. Um, so just briefly, uh, advisory is planning to hold a meeting um, this coming Wednesday to discuss budgets and really the implications of um, what a economic downturn slash recession could mean for the town and what we can um, help do to um, prepare the town for that potential. Uh, I have reached out to a number of the departments already and myself and the other members of advisory will continue to do so um, and we will come we will um, be asking the departments to come back with budgets that are revised downward in most cases uh, i don't have any hard numbers as of yet uh, but um, we take heed of what paul dorensis mentioned at your last meeting two weeks ago that um, we really need to be mindful of what the economic possibilities will look like for fiscal year 21. Thank you. Sharon, do you have anything else to add? Uh, nope, that, that's, nope, I'm fine. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Sure. Uh, just on that, on that item, I do want to just mention again that, Sharon, if you could work with the different cap people who've requested capital items and really discuss, make sure only, you know, make sure they know everything's being pushed out till September unless unless they can make a good case that it's a critical item that needs to be done in Q1. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. I was gonna add one thing if I could, George. Yep, go ahead. Is we may have some increased expenses in the coronavirus COVID response uh, categories, but 
while they may increase the budget temporarily, they will likely be reimbursable from uh, MEMA. So um, there's probably some situations that we're going to be looking at um, having to cover the cost for a short time until we get reimbursed. Okay. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, um, one thing on that note, um, and Sharon, you may want to talk to Don about this, but at their school committee, I was at their joint school committee meeting last week on Zoom, and I think there's some potential for some big savings on the transportation contract, just because they're not providing transportation services right now, and if the bus company is able to get the PPP loan, then we wouldn't then be paying them because they'd be getting paid through the federal government. So there's there's potential for some big savings on the transportation costs for the schools that that you're just going to want to work out with Don. Okay, I'll definitely reach out to her. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, next, I think it's an item for on Verizon. Is that right? Sorry, I've got multiple screens up here and I lost where I was. Yeah, George, I, I think it's a pretty routine matter is to reopen okay. the negotiations on the cable contract. I, I, unless somebody feels differently, I would move to have the town administrator on behalf of the select board send a letter to Verizon looking to start informal negotiations on the contract. That's, that's the motion and town council has recommended it, but I think it's pretty routine business. Okay. So I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Um, all right, I will do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Jan? Aye. Mr. Waldron? Aye. Mr. Drensis? You're muted, Paul, I can't hear you. He mute himself? Yeah, I think, Paul, unmute, there you go. I, I, I wanted to have some discussion, but I'm gonna vote aye. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see, I think you were muted, so I didn't hear that you were trying to say anything. When can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, you can say something now, go ahead. All right, thank, thank for the negotiations that we ought to hire uh, Phil August, uh, uh, Bill August, or one of the regular cable council, rather than just use our town council. There are council out there who do nothing but this cable stuff, and they're very good, very experienced, uh, and I'd recommend we go that way. Yeah, I'd, re I'd recommend that we hire Mike Giamo, except I think he represents Verizon, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you voted, Darren? Yes. Just very quickly, Bill Hewitt from our firm who does the cable negotiations for the town probably does the most in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's all he does. And he, he I believe, has the large if not the largest, certainly one of the largest practices in the Commonwealth of negotiating, re, renegotiating and negotiating these cable contracts. Darren, what is his name or her name? Bill Hewitt. Bill Hewitt. Thanks. So we have a vote. Paul, Paul, you voted I. I think, well, who did I call on already? I'm sorry. I, I'll just do it again. Eric Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jan. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Mr. Durantis. Aye. And I vote aye. All right, sorry about that. I got a little distracted. Um, so the other, the next item is select board reports. Do I have any reports from anyone? I have one, but if anybody else has anything, go ahead, Paul. Uh, well, I want to ask a question of Jeff Waldron. Yes. I understand that Jeff Waldron has uh, uh, procured on behalf of the town, some uh, face mask and other equipment and would like to hear more about it. Absolutely. I, Paul, Jeff, please go ahead and explain what you did. I think you, it's not only for our town, but a number of towns, so. Okay, yeah, I mean, the first thing I want to do is uh, thank the teams. Zach, uh, 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 Lieutenant Bento, um, um, Heidi Doyle and Sharon, have been involved as well as the Board of Health, uh, Ellen and Daryl. It, it was sort of a fluke, but uh, through a contact of mine who's um, a senior executive at property and casualty firm, we became aware of an opportunity to, to buy some N95 masks for the town <coughs> from a vendor who um, 
is based in New Delhi, India, but has been in this business for decades. So it's not someone that just cropped up overnight in the um, uh, COVID space. So anyway, long story short, but we had to order a minimum of 10,000 masks to get the, uh, we basically were getting a factory slot to manufacture them. And there, um, and David Williams was very um, involved as well in uh, helping to set it up. So um, we got the slot only because um, Zach was able to cable to cobble together um, multiple towns. So we're now supply, we, so we, ordered 11, we ended up ordering 11,200 masks. Um, we accepted delivery on Wednesday of 5,920. Tomorrow we're going to have another shipment of 1,680. So by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll have 7,600 of the masks. And we're still trying to source the original, the final 3,600 to complete our initial order. Um, so the masks are not just for our town. In order to get the bulk order, we had to um, pull either get people together, which Zach has done. So we're supplying masks now for Sherburne, Framingham, Ashland, Holliston, Millis, Medfield, Dover, Natick, Norfolk, Lincoln, and Upton. And there's been, Zach, I, maybe you want to provide you know, because you've reached out to some of the uh, fire chiefs, the response that you've gotten in the last few days, and some of the, he, Zach's been delivering the masks to some towns in very, very dire need. Absolutely. So uh, when we had this opportunity, um, believe it or not, I thought we were going to have trouble uh, with interest for 10,000 masks, and I basically uh, just called some people I knew, and, and we had the, the 10,000 slot filled in about uh, 30 minutes. So, um, you know, there was certainly a need and, uh, you know, luckily we, we got that first shipment yesterday around noon um, and every town uh, that was involved had, um, you know, about half of their order by three o'clock um, yesterday. And some of them were running extremely low in supplies. Uh, one town had less than 10 N95 uh, masks left, which is unbelievable. Um, so it was certainly needed. Um, you know, we were able to help every one of our neighbors, uh, which they all certainly appreciate. So again, thank you to Select and Waldron and everybody that worked on this. Great work, guys. I really, I really was happy to hear that this was able to happen. Jeff, great work. Zach, thank you. Um, Anybody let's, else? Uh, Chuck? Let's, let's remember that list of towns that, you know, in the future when we need some help from <laughs> Birmingham, Ashland, Holliston, Millis, Medfield, Dover, Natick, Norfolk, Lincoln, and up the night. <laughs> we just found out we're trying to negotiate water supply in uh, exactly. a <laughs> tax <laughs> You know, I, I'm not sure how much leverage it is, but uh, there should be some yeah. carbon. <laughs> um, I have one other selectman report to, to uh, share as part of the regional negotiating committee with the multiple school committees and Dover, I sat on the, the committee and we ratified the contract with the teachers, a three-year contract starting in fiscal year 21 last Tuesday over a Zoom meeting as a, in a joint school committee meeting. So everybody was very pleased with how it turned out. I mean, it was a, we had started back in October and finished up, like I said, it was ratified last week. Um, the teachers voted 98% to accept the contract. It was a unanimous vote of all the school committees. And just from my understanding, last three years ago, it was a very contentious negotiation. And this year, it went very smoothly. Everybody was cordial. Everybody got along. We kind of worked through a lot of issues together. And I think everybody was very pleased with how, how it turned out. And financially, I know Stephen Leahy will want to hear this. I, I think it's good for the town as well and fair to the teachers. I, I, the step in, I mean, the matrix increases uh, over the three years is 6.35 with the first year being under 2%. So that's, uh, I think that was a, there was a lot of negotiations back and forth on numbers and that that's where it came out. So, so I was, I'm happy to, that that is complete. Um, does anybody else have any other select board reports? I have a select board question. This really yes. one over. Um, I know with the, obviously the COVID and kind of handling things more emergent, 
But um, are we still advancing the um, uh, the hiring of a full time fire chief? Is that is it worth maybe getting that process established? So either when the COVID calms down, we can trigger it or yes, I'd like to put that as an agenda item for our next meeting because I would like to to be blunt, I'd like to move for I mean, I would like to move forward with our in looking into seeing if we can go forward with our interim chief, I think a lot of people are very happy with him. And Jeff, I know you've been emailing me about this quite a bit. So, um, so I think we need to talk with the personnel board on a couple of things. But that's, that's, I think we should, we should move forward with that. Okay. Um, anyone else? If not, I have no idea where my agenda went. So just give me a second. Here. Just, uh, I'd ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. If to uh, the issue of the sustainability coordinator. I know we now have the two of them working and I'm wondering uh, what are they working on and uh, are they in fact work working or, or is this shutdown from the pandemic caused a delay? David? David? I think he's this number that ends in 850, Jeff, if you've got him muted. Uh, is that him? Yeah, yep. I did. David. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> I found you. Yeah, they've, been, <laughs> they've been meeting with uh, the Energy Committee. I think they've met three times already. And they are working on some items. And it would be best to bring them in on the 30th and let them explain what their first projects oh, are. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, that's a great idea. Great. Okay. If we have nothing further, then I'm going to adjourn to executive session to possibly return to open session. Um, item one is MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the town and the chair so declares police officers union may return to open session. Item two, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, police officers union may return to open session. Uh, the chair so declares on both of those items, by the way. MGL, item three, MGL chapter 30A, sub, section 21A, subsection two, to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, town administrator, may return to open session. And item four, MGL chapter 30A, section 21A, subsection three, to discuss strategy with respect to, that, to uh, threat and potential litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the town and the chair so declares library. And I declare on that as well. So I need a second and a roll call vote. The motion is seconded by Eric, Eric Johnson. By Mr. Johnson, having a second, we'll now have a roll call vote. Mr. Dorensis. Dorensis votes aye. Mr. Yan. Aye. Mr. Waldron. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. I vote aye. Having a pass by a vote of five to zero, the open session is now closed and we will not be returning to open session. We are now in executive session. Mm -hmm.